formalmente na minha formação? É, eu sou bolsista no ministério. Ah, então, meio que conta. Ju, pode começar? Sim? Tá bom. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the last day of the 2023 Conference of the Social Science Universities Network. My name is João Maia. I'm a sociologist and associate professor here in FGV CPDOC. And I'm proud to chair the roundtable Digital Literacy and Critical Pedagogies. Uh, we, we will have only two papers because both Dan the two Danis are missing, right? Um, so first we will hear uh, Martina Ferracani from the European University Institute. Uh, who co-authored the paper Preparing Students for the Digital Era, Lessons Learned from Fab Schools in Schools, uh, with uh, Veronica Ballerini, Adriana Del Falco, Alice Dominici, Fiametta Menchetti, and Silvia Norgian. Did I pronounce right? <laughs> yeah. uh, then, next we move to Daniel Seco and Juliana Marques, both from FGV CPDOC who will jointly present the paper Digital Literacy, Shaping Digital Skills for Social Science. Uh, each paper will have like 20 minutes. I will be generous with the time, but not too generous, <laughs> okay? And then I will collect a few questions from the audience and I'll pose a few questions myself and hopefully we will have a nice time here. So thank you and Martina, please. Well, thanks a lot, and thanks to see you all again today. Uh, so my paper today is uh, very different from the one I presented yesterday. Yesterday was kind of my real job, digital trade, regulation, policy, and law. Uh, today I talk about something which I'm passionate about, which are fab labs. I will tell you a bit about what they are and uh, what we are doing, uh, what we did to try to assess the impact of fab labs in schools. Uh, so. Uh, what I will uh, do is first tell you a bit about the concept of Fab Labs and the project Fab School, which is the project that we evaluated to check the impact of this project on the skills of the high school students. Um, I will uh, tell you what we did. It's a randomized controlled trial, so what uh, it is usually done with uh, drugs, that you give some, some drugs to some people, to others you don't, and then you check the impact like after some time our variables have changed to check the impact of the, of the specific drug. But we did this with students, uh, and then the findings of our analysis. So to start with, uh, Fab Labs. Any of you knows what Fab Labs are and what Fab Lab stands for? Maybe Juliana, you know. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> Anyone? No one heard of Fab Labs? Okay, so it means uh, fabrication laboratory. And this is a concept that uh, started in 2001 with the MIT. They created the first lab. And the idea of Fab Lab is that you put in a one room uh, machines that uh, allow people to do almost anything. So 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC, and then the, you have access to skills like uh, programming or 3D modeling. Um, Fab Labs are just a place to democratize access to science and uh, technology. And, uh, since 2001, uh, they have spread all over the world, and there are thousands of fab labs all over the world. I, I uh, challenge you to check in your own city where you live. If there is a fab lab, probably there is. Uh, in Italy, we have uh, around 100 fab labs, and uh, yeah, they are really over, over everywhere. In Rio, there are also some. In Sao Paulo, there is the biggest network of fab labs in the world. Uh, in the, and back then, when I was living there, uh, they were about to, to, to launch the public network of fab labs. So it's really a great uh, word that still is not uh, a lot well known. And uh, just to tell you a bit uh, about how uh, a researcher like me ended up in fab labs, I studied economics, so uh, it's not really like a, a place where usually an economist would end up. Uh, but I discovered the 3D printing when I was working in Brussels, and I was really fascinated by the potential impact of 3D printing on trade. So I went to volunteer in Brazil. I was in Sao Paulo eight years ago. And this is the picture of the last week uh, before I left uh, Brazil, in which I was invited to give a class to high school students on 3D printing. And this class changed uh, the path of my life because I decided to create an NGO in Sicily, which is called Fab Lab West in Sicily. So I created a Fab Lab. Uh, now we have four Fab Labs in Sicily. And what we do, uh, we train high school students um, to use this kind of technologies in a creative way. So the idea of Fab Labs is that, is that uh, you don't only teach 
technology, like how to use a 3D printer, but to you teach how to use technology to solve problems, to create things. So there's this uh, learning by doing pedagogical approach, which is what we then are trying to assess in our paper to see whether this kind of approach stimulates interest in STEM or other type of, vari um, of uh, variables that I will show you in a moment. So to give you just some examples, this is a workshop done with uh, eight to ten years old girls in which we created a microscope in one uh, hour. So the girls learn how to 2D model, how to laser cut this, uh, uh, this microscope, and then they learn how to uh, use um, a webcam, destroy a webcam, open it up and turn it to use it as a lens, etc. So this is a kind of a laboratory activity that uh, is also tested in, our, um, in, in the RCT I will present. And this is another one in which the uh, primary school students were creating a bee house, a house for the bees with the, the sensors and to check how the bees go in the house or not. So this is just to show you the kind of uh, learning by doing approach that is used by Fab Labs to then uh, teach digital skills. So at the, the, end, uh, the end result is that students learn how to use the technology, but also they develop uh, some skills like creativity uh, or other important 21st century skills. Or at least this is our hypothesis, that this, uh, these courses have this impact. Um, and um, what, uh, what we did, uh, I had the opportunity to, to, do, to test the impact of a project, which uh, was done in the north of Italy. It's a project funded by these two foundations in the north of Italy, and th these are all the fab labs, the fab labs that were invited to give the courses. So they, they run this, uh, this very big project with thousands of students, and they invited me halfway to, to try to assess the impact of these courses on the students. They knew that I was in academia and I was in the fab lab world, so they, uh, they looked for someone that could uh, assess the impact of this uh, fab school project. Uh, what is this project about? Uh, this project is about creating fab labs in schools. That's why it's called fab school. So they set up different laboratories in different schools throughout Italy. Uh, and then they, they, they provided creative courses to, to students. And uh, these courses were done in five different cities that you see in this map, so mostly north of Italy. And I also included my co uh, fab lab in a, like, the courses we did in Agrigento. So we also had students that followed activities that were not formally part of the project, but they were very similar, so they could uh, be considered uh, the same type of, uh, of activities. And uh, in total, we had uh, 710 students that uh, were part of our study. So the, the, the number is not very high for an RCT. That's why a lot of uh, results are not statistically significant. But this, we consider this a pilot um, and, and we, in which we learned a lot on how to replicate this kind of study on a bigger um, group of students. But still, 710 is, is good enough to, for a pilot. And uh, i show you what, uh, what the, how we did it and uh, what we found. So uh, we did an RCT, as I was saying, and this is the paper um, that um, is co-authored with several PhD and postdoc students, um, researchers from UI and the University of Florence. As a result of this, we have two uh, new working papers that are coming out. In one working paper, we focus on interest in STEM, um, and so interest in pursuing university careers in STEM as career aspirations. In the other paper, we look at soft skills, so creativity and grit. I will tell you a bit more about those. Um, for those of you that don't know what an RCT is, um, just, just some things about the process first and then I'll tell you a bit more about the RCT. So what we had to do, because we are working with the minors uh, below 18 years old, so we did to, to do an ethical evaluation, first of all, which is quite uh, intensive with the university. We had to answer a lot of questions about how we're going to treat this data, uh, how are we are going to inform the students that they are part of an RCT uh, and inform them that some of them will be excluded from, this, um, from the potential possibility to join the courses. So we did all this uh, ethical evaluation and we got the ethical approval by the university. And part of the ethical approval was also the data protection assessment. So we are fully compliant with GDPR, uh, as otherwise we could have not done this, uh, this study. And uh, we did this by having an informed consent signed by the students and by the parents. So it would have been enough to inform the parents, but we also wanted to inform the students for full like ethical uh, kind of coherence. Uh, so we also informed each of the students that they were going to be part of the study. Then we um, did an entry questionnaire in October 2021. So before uh, they even knew if they could join any activity, we did a first entry questionnaire for the 710 students. Then we randomly selected. We did a um, public uh, random uh, selection of the classes. So the students 
knew why they were um, they had the possibility or not to join the courses because we randomly selected those that could join the activities and those that couldn't and then uh, some of those that could join the, they were in the group that could join the activities uh, rolled to the activities and then we we of course run the activities throughout the year we did three type of activities uh, short type of uh, courses below 20 hours long courses above 20 hours and then hackathon courses which are uh, short challenge courses in which the students are giving a challenge to, uh, uh, to answer and then they compete uh, with the solution and then you win a prize. And these hackathon activities are those that were found to have the most impact on the students. So this is one of the more quality, qualitative fundings of the, of the study. And then we did an exit questionnaire in May last year and now we are analyzing all the, all the data. Um, so, to tell you a bit more about RCT and to make sure that all of you understand uh, what we did, um, so we had randomly selected an uh, experimental group, so these are the students that can join our activities, and then there is a control group, they cannot join the activities. So one of the di most difficult things for me was to explain to the schools and to the parents why the students could not join, because their uh, questions were very important for us to check uh, the answers compared to the answers of those who instead could join the activities. And then we just uh, we, we empirically assess whether there is a statistically significant impact on some variables. So what do we check? Uh, the first variable is the interest to go to university and also to enroll in STEM. So in uh, STEM is science, technology, engineering and maths major. And as you no, like these are uh, the university careers that are most associated with jobs and in Italy we have a problem with the student, uh, young people not being able to uh, find a proper job so enrolling in STEM is probably associated with a better career, uh, better job opportunities. Um, we also check uh, how they feel, whether the interest in STEM increases and whether their perceived capability to do STEM increases. Uh, because sometimes, especially for, for girls, uh, they don't feel that they are capable of doing STEM, so we also check this. Uh, we look at professional aspirations, so whether they want to work in STEM areas or other technical jobs, and, hi, uh, and we also check creativity, um, in particular divergent thinking, which is one part of creativity, I will tell you a bit more about this, and grit. Grit is like perseverance. I will tell you a bit more about this. Creativity and grit are soft skills, which are some of the skills considered to be uh, most important in the 21st century to find a job um, and to fulfill uh, themselves as, uh, as uh, young people. So we wanted to, f to check whether Fab Labs had uh, such an impact. Um, so these are the five variables that we look. About a bit more about creative, creativity and divergent thinking. Uh, creativity, just to give you a definition, is very wide. Uh, so here there is a one, one definition, is their interaction among aptitude, process and environment by which an individual group produces a perceptible product that is both novel and useful as defined within a social context. And uh, there are different angles of creativity. What we uh, decided to focus on was the divergent thinking part. Uh, so the, the possibility uh, and the uh, potential of people to provide different type of solutions to problems and to think out of the box, which is one of the skills considered very important in our uh, 21st century um, um, job space. Um, and how do we measure this? We use the PISA uh, creative thinking framework. There's an OECD framework that they use also in schools uh, to to also measure creativity. Uh, we also use uh, uh, the alternative test, um, um, users test by Guilford. So to tell you exactly what we did, in the entry questionnaire, we simply asked, how would you use a bottle of plastic? To, to, like, how would you reuse it? So they had to, in two minutes, they had to provide all the different potential uses of this plastic bottle. And also we told them, in the future, your bike will not have pedals, how would you reuse these pedals? So this is to test how many uh, different uh, solutions the student can give uh, to, to these uh, two questions. Uh, in the final questionnaire at the end, we, all, we ask very similar questions because we need to compare the two answers. So we say, how do, would you reuse a can, a simple can, and how would you imagine a bike in the future? So these were the questions. The answers were uh, really amazing sometimes, and it was very fun to, to then give a score to each of them. We had to then measure for each uh, answer, give a score from one to five, depending on the level of creativity of the student. Um, and how do we did it? Um, we, we created a scale based on four 
different components of divergent thinking, fluency, flexibility, originality, and elaboration. So we hired a high school teacher. She's very familiar with the creative pedagogy, and she checked each of the answers without knowing the name of the student. So it was fully uh, objective. Uh, just to tell you a bit more about what it means, fluency is the answer of Anna, so we'll be giving a lot of answers. If, you, if in two minutes they come up with 10 different possible applications, we consider this student to be very fluent. Flexibility means giving answers which are a bit diverse, so thinking about solutions that are different from one another. It could be like a face, a wheel, or a ball, while if you look at Carol, these are different wheels and balls, so this less uh, flexible. Originality is a giving a very a solution which is very different from the others so it's uh, like this balloon or this bomb so thinking a bit out of the box and when students add high originality we gave an extra kind of high score on creativity and then elaboration there are many students that are very detailed as you can see with the last one so some students created like in five minutes entire histories about the future of bikes and so in this case we gave a higher score as well. So these are the five components that we assess for each of the answers of the 710 uh, students. And then we also use a self-assessment scale which is called the short scale of creative self uh, to have also a self-assessment uh, measure of creativity. For GRIT instead, I don't know if you watched this TED talk, it's uh, great, in the, it's a te TED talk by Angela Duckworth, uh, she's a professor and she was uh, measuring the impact of, uh, of um, uh, GRIT on students and she found that uh, GRIT as, as intended as uh, passion and perseverance for long term goals is considered a 21st century skill and is a predictor of success. So that's why we wanted to focus on this other um, skill um, or yeah, soft skill of the student. How do we measure this? We use the, 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 the scale uh, created by uh, um, the Professor Duckworth. So we just use what is already out there in the literature and we replicate it. Uh, uh, I asked uh, these questions to the students. So this is also self-reported grid based on this questionnaire. Findings to conclude. What do we find? Um, this two impo an important thing here, we have for each um, uh, variable, we have the intention to treat, and it's very interesting. Intention to treat means offering the possibility to students to join the courses. It means being selected and being offered the opportunity. It doesn't mean that they follow the courses. Even being offered the opportunity to join the course has a statistically um, uh, a significant impact of the students, and this is probably because uh, this, some of the students in the class that were selected were already joining the activity, so there is some um, effect on the, on the uh, classmates. Uh, and also, just they, were, they, they knew that this thing existed. So having the possibility still uh, has a positive impact in many cases. I will tell you a bit more. And then we have the uh, F actual effect on the students who follow the activities, which is often stronger. So having the possibility to join already has an impact and uh, joining is an additional positive impact. So here what we find is that we find an increased interest in going to university. Uh, so a higher number of students that want to enroll and this is driven entirely by the intention to go in STEM majors. So we do find that only offering the potential, the, the opportunity to join and then of course joining the courses increase the interest of the students to uh, enroll in STEM. And this, at least for, for, for a person like me that for eight years is working with Fab Labs to support students, is a, a great result. It means that we can have an impact on the future, uh, on the interest in the, um, of the students and their choice to enroll in university. Then uh, regarding uh, the uh, job of the future, what they want to do when they are older, we are still a bit cataloging the answers, but uh, uh, we have as workers, like technical workers and professionals means STEM careers. So what we find is a, post a negative impact on, uh, technical, on, on wanting to be a technical uh, worker. Uh, and no effect on STEM. So the students, there are less students interested in doing manual technical jobs, which is also a kind of positive result considering we were working with the technical schools. So they kind of go away from g doing low paid technical jobs. And, but we don't see an increase, statistically significant increase in the interest to go um, to do STEM uh, pr jobs. Although the sign is positive, so something is there. It might also be due to the fact that the number of students was not very high. 
Um, then, uh, just to tell you a bit more about the gender, this is very interesting because what we see is that in terms of uh, uh, going to STEM, uh, the interest in enrolling to university in STEM majors is entirely driven by women. So the girls are those that were mostly impacted by this kind of activities, while in terms of the jobs, uh, the males are those that are uh, less interested in pursuing technical uh, jobs. So th the gender dimension is also interesting here. Um, then um, for, uh, the for the mechanism that drives this interest in going to STEM, we check whether they have more interest in, uh, in STEM in general, for example, their favorite subject in school, or whether they feel that they are more capable of doing STEM. And what we find is uh, the mechanism is probably the confidence in STEM. So they increase their, their, their self-confidence in being able to pursue um, uh, STEM uh, majors, while we don't see any change in their favorite subject in school so the interest in school uh, in stem in school doesn't change so they still don't like maths but they are more confident that they can go in university and study technical subjects stem subjects and to conclude that's the last table uh, on grit and creativity what we find this we, this is uh, the only intention to treat uh, we have another table but it's still in the making uh, on the actual uh, effect on the treated but uh, the, just the intention to treat so being able to join the activities has a statistically significant impact on grit and creativity we don't find it on self-reported creativity, but uh, when we look at the actual treatment, uh, so the students that have been treated and follow the courses, we also find statistically significant impact on that. So overall, uh, more interest in going to STEM universities, uh, more grit and more creativity for the students who follow the courses. So this is uh, just a pilot, and we hope to replicate it with more students, but already there are uh, interesting results um, that come out from this study. Thanks. Thank you, Martina, for this wonderful presentation, right on time. <laughs> and I invite Juliana and Daniel to start the presentation. Thank you, Martina. It was very inspiring to learn about this project, this pilot project. Um, good morning, everyone. So I will give this presentation together with Danielle. And we would like to talk about uh, some of the products and some findings or the ideas that we have for a research project on digital literacy named Di Shaping Digital Skills for Social Scientists and Historians as well. And we have collaborated on it with our colleagues, Jimmy Medeiros and Suemi Higuchi, who are also from FGV School of Social Sciences. Um, I'll be making an introduction, uh, telling you a bit more about how the project came about. Um, then uh, Danielle will talk about the key product so far, which is the Programming Historian in Portuguese, a platform that he will talk much more about. Uh, and then um, I'll conclude sharing a little bit of the other goals of the project and um, where we are going with it. Uh, so it's a bit above about our experimentation with digital pedagogy, not an experiment, but just our experience in the classrooms here. Um, where should I point? Okay. So what it is about. Um, it's about digital literacy among social scientists and historians, undergraduate students in Brazil and Portugal. So for this project, we also teamed up with colleagues um, from Nova University in Lisbon. Uh, as we had been sharing a lot of information and our personal experiences with them about uh, participating in digital humanities projects and and this Lusophone world, meaning uh, Portuguese-speaking uh, countries. Um, and not many people ha may have these figures in mind, but approximately 270 million speakers of Portuguese on the world. And this means like the sixth most spoken language. Uh, and we have been exchanging a lot of information about using historical collections in Portuguese, for example, and, and data that is relevant uh, to our regions when uh, teaching digital humanities. So we found out that we have many shared challenges when teaching digital humanities. Um, 
So, yeah, and I think everyone here knows, obviously, that um, there is an a increase uh, right, in the need for professionals, not only from STEM, with a STEM background, STEM experts, but also who, are, who dominate subjects in the humanities, history, cultural studies. We're also very proficient in digital methods, computational methods. So we are not talking about just inter interdisciplinary collaboration, but actually forming uh, humanities professionals um, who can actually navigate uh, different disciplines and both worlds. And so with that in mind, um, we realized that some of the barriers and difficulties we face are related to language, considering that most resources for digital humanities are in English. And in Brazil specifically, most undergrad students didn't have the chance to become proficient in a second language, meaning English. Um, differences in or different digital uh, literacy gaps. And this is a wonderful project to try to assess uh, these uh, digital literacies as well with uh, high school students. Um, and, and this leads us to another question too about uh, what should be the basic skills or digital skills that uh, humanities and social sciences students uh, should acquire in their courses for an R, for example, sociology or literature students uh, across the globe learning about um, how uh, natural language processing or natural language models work, as Janice Butler so nicely explained yesterday. I would bet that in most places they are not learning about this. Uh, so it, this is another topic too that we haven't touched so much yet in this conference about this inequality and the digital d divide. Uh, so it, and this is something that we are interested in, on. Um, so I would love to hear about you in the audience, about the curriculum in your institutions as well, if you want to share, because we ha are having this conversation here. Um, and I think that the Sun Network actually is a very nice place where we can engage in this kind of conversation because we have institutions from uh, non-English speaking countries and different regions of the world. So I think it would be very interesting to uh, learn more about this from you. Uh, and another common challenge in Brazil and Portugal is that there is an asymmetry between a more um, consolid consolidated tradition in qualitative studies in comparison with more mixed methods and computational approaches to uh, research in the humanities and social sciences. And um, of course, this is, there is a changing trend uh, with that regard, but we still see here that, for, ex for instance, many uh, colleagues, scholars, professors are either less familiar with uh, these novel technologies, methodologies, or even skeptical or mistrustful of it. So um, these are all com more common challenges. So given this context, um, The, our project main goal is to help launch war or was to help launch the Portuguese version of a platform called Pro the Programming Historian, of which Daniel will talk about, and other goals included monitoring the use of these lessons that uh, the platform uh, offers, methodological lessons in the classrooms in both institutions. Um, and we do that through participatory observation, also entry surveys and endpoint surveys with students taking part in these courses and focus groups with students to understand their relation, their, how they're related to the platform and to learning digital humanities uh, in general. Um, so yeah, so the, the PH platform I think addresses this language barrier that was mentioning before and this monitoring of lessons in the classrooms kind of gives us a better idea of these digital literacy gaps among our students um, and how and, and to accompany how they develop these new skill sets that we want them to develop. Um, and in our site in Brazil, we also did a national survey on DH teaching with uh, heads of undergraduate programs across Brazil in all regions. So we wanted to also understand what's going on from the perspective of the higher education institutions. Uh, what kind of courses are they given? Have, do they have like a, a specific hiring tr a strategy of you know, making their 
uh, faculty more diverse or or of facilitating interdisciplinary work because something that we learn uh, from the specialized literature on DH is that for example DH teaching is very interdisciplinary and collaborative but in our surveys actually we don't think that's true for Brazil because w or for example we learn about the importance of DH centers connecting dif different faculties in universities or the role of uh, research infrastructures and computational infrastructure to uh, giving support to faculty and students who want to engage with digital humanities but do these uh, support agents and institutions e even exist in Brazil or in most institutions they don't actually so ac what we see here from what uh, so far is that these are um, there aren't many institutional um, structure or motivation for this change in curriculum and research practices so this is this relies much more in individual um, scholars, professors, or research groups wanting to invest on that and attracting people who are already prone and interested in getting into that world. So learning opportunities, they are not universal, they are not uh, equally you know, offered um, or have not been in the last five years or so. This may be changing now. Um, and yeah, so the main question, so guiding these efforts, um, the national survey with course um, coordinators and the monitoring of lessons and um, yeah, launching the PH in Portuguese is learning more about what are digital humanities or these computational methods, you know, um, turn in the humanities um, in non-English non speaking context, contexts. And what has been taught as digital humanities? What has been considered in digital humanities? Because maybe we take that as granted um, because we're reading a certain literature that reflects a certain reality of uh, specific, specific zones in the planet. But uh, this is not very diverse from what we've seen. Um, yeah, and digital humanities, of course, teaching can take many forms, like workshops, whole degree programs, short courses, and, and we believe that the programming historian is one form of uh, promoting that. So I'll let Danielle jump in, and I'll come back in the end to talk a little more about uh, our experience in classroom. So thank you, Juliana. Um, I said my name is Daniel. I'm a fellow hisar researcher here at FGV CPDOC. I want to first thank uh, Juliana and uh, the team for having me here to present a little bit about this, this project. And I said I'm going to present a little bit of what is the, the key uh, project of digital literacy project. Uh, what, what is its goals? How does it work? And how is FGV helping um, the to spread and make more democratic for its content to be spread about the, in the, in the Lusophon world. And I, f I, I think personally that every good project, no matter uh, how big and how complex it is, uh, it can be summed up in just one or two sentences. And Programming Historian uh, kind of nails it right in their homepage. Uh, they consider them as a novice-friendly, peer-reviewed tutorial that help humanists learn a wide range of digital tools, techniques, and workflows to facilitate research and teaching, uh, committed to fostering a diverse and inclusive community of editors, writers, and readers. So that kind of sums up what is the platform. It's been online since uh, 2008 already. Uh, this is like a, a little glance of the, the project and the, and the website itself. So here you can have a glimpse of what it's look, it looks like, the, the lessons that are available there, um, all of its infos, the, the guidelines for all kind of roles that you can have inside of the platform, uh, the lessons itself that you can filter by the, the uh, stage uh, of project that you're into, uh, which tools do you want to use, etc. There's a part for events as well that they share inside of the platform. 
and everything is hosted at GitHub, uh, the, um, the repository, uh, where we can have like a total control of the versioning of uh, the platform itself. Uh, all of the website and the lessons are hosted in there, uh, so we have total control of the, the versioning and the uh, disposable of, the, of it. Uh, all of it is open source, is one of the main concepts of uh, programming historian. So I'm, I'm talking a little bit more about it later. But uh, both the, the website and the lessons are total open source. The, the website is made with JQ, uh, we visit, uh, uh, within the MIT license, which is free to use, free to share as well. Um, and there's the, the part of issues as well, uh, which will, uh, is where we control uh, all of the, the workflow that happens within the lessons with the volunteers that work. Uh, in the programming historian, so all of the the revisioning, the the, tr the translation of the lessons as well, everything is controlled there. All of the discussions are held inside the GitHub, so it's all uh, centered in that platform, uh, so we can have control of everything. Um, some of the values that are up with the the programming historian, uh, it's all peer reviewed. So for every lesson that is held at the platform, there's two reviewers and one editor uh, which may take control for each author of one lesson. There's two, per, two uh, persons, the two volunteers that are going to review all of its contents, the code, uh, the, the prints, the content inside to see if everything is up to date, if everything is uh, well spelled and everything. Uh, one editor that takes control of, its, uh, of this work as well. And for each translation as well, there's two more reviewings, one more editor that takes control of the translation uh, to make sure that the translation as well is available and comfortable. Uh, for example, for the Portuguese uh, version, uh, we make sure that uh, since it's accessed both for uh, Brazilian and uh, Portugal, uh, which have some language differences, that we can make it um, as um, open and adapted as possible for the whole Lusophon world. Uh, so we make sure that uh, the, the reviewing is okay. It's all open source, as I said before. Uh, the, uh, even for the, the content of the, the lessons that is inside of the platform, uh, the, the pro language program, programming language that are there, the softwares, everything is made up for the lessons to be as accessible as possible for everyone uh, without needing to uh, buy a, li a license for a, for a software or for a, a library in a, in a programming um, a language, etc. So everything tries to be the more open and accessible as possible. It's Diamond Open Access, which means that uh, the, the whole platform is under the, the Creative Commons CC BY um, uh, open access. Um, Opa. Just a sec. Okay. Um, it's so it's free to repost. All of these lessons can be reposted uh, with the credits, of course. Um, so um, it's all open to to access, and it's indexed at the the director of open access journals as well. Uh, it's well awarded. From now, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit about the, the awards uh, the platform already have. Uh, in 2016, the English version of the Programming Historian gets the Digital Humanities Award for Best Series of Posts. Then in 2017, uh, the Spanish ver version of the Programming Historian as well gets the same prize. In 2018, the Spanish version, version as well gets for the Best Training Initiative of 2018 for the Humanidad Digitalis Hispanica Association. Then in 2020, uh, the, the program historian for itself got the, the Canadian Social Knowledge Institute's Open Scholarship Award. And in 2021, uh, the program historian got the Coco Foundation's Open Publishing Award as well. There's a diversity policy that are under the, the program historian as well, uh, which means to, to be uh, the, the, the volunteers that work inside of the platform as, will be as diverse and plural and, oh, and ambient, there is harassment free as well. So uh, it incentives for people from uh, less um, 
represented groups to to work in the in the platform. Uh, it, it 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 extends as well to the editorial council as well, and the funding and ownership. Uh, this is. It's, as I said, it's all driven by, vol by volunteers. Uh, the program itself is registered as a company limited by guarantee, and it's administered by a charity institution in England and Wales. Uh, there's, and there's the rules that you can uh, get into the platform, as I said. So uh, inside of the platform, you can be an author, so you can make like a whole new lesson in your own language that can be translated or not, it depends. Um, but you can make like a whole new lesson with your programming language, with your tools, with your experience, and uh, there's the, the directives for the lessons to be written, and you can uh, make it free for everyone to, to access. You can be an editor of the, the program as well, so the, the lessons there are already inside of the, the platform. Uh, you can review and you can uh, make sure that everything uh, is uh, correct. You can be a translator, and that's the work that uh, FGV and Nova from Lisboa uh, are more into, uh, making the, the lessons more accessible in more languages. And then now we have for Spanish, uh, French, and Portuguese since 2021. And you can be a reviewer as well, even for new lessons or for uh, translations as well, making sure everything is up to date, everything is corrected, and correct translated as well. Uh, there's a little bit of the history of the, the program history as well. In 2018, the project started uh, from Turco and McCurtain. Uh, they started the project uh, not as the, the, in the model that it's known today. Uh, it was like uh, it started with a blog po post in 2008. Uh, then they started to give one or two lessons uh, within another platform uh, in the Networking Canadian Story and Environment platform. But then in 2012, uh, they got an expansion and then they got uh, new volunteers and they got like a, a, a group to start to work in the project. And they got into this new, uh, this new model that is the model that we know today that has a website that everything is more accessible uh, under its own licenses and everything. And then in 2017, uh, the, the first lessons in Spanish has started six years ago, and then the, the platform in Spanish as a separated par part of the, the programming story started, started with lessons translated and reviewed in Spanish. Then in 2019, uh, in French, the same process, there's a, a different part of the, the, the platform uh, just for the lessons that are translated and created in this language. In the, in the Final part of 2020, FGV and Nova de Lisboa started this project in Portuguese. Uh, in January 2021, we published uh, the first lesson in Portuguese. And since 2021, uh, the, the platform is available in Portuguese as well. Um, so uh, a little bit of the, the state of art, um, what, uh, how it's uh, for now. The, the PA, the Programming Historian itself, uh, the, the original English version, are ha already have 97 lessons. And then in 2016, the, the project in Spanish started, and they have more than half of the, its lessons translated. Some of them are originals as well. Then in 2019, the, the, the French version started. They already have 24 lessons as well. And in 2021, we started our translations and in two years, we are already above it with 36 lessons translated, reviewed, and adapted as well. If you give a look uh, for productivity, uh, we have the, the, the higher of all of them because uh, in like 26 months that we are in, acti in activity, we already translated 36 lessons, which m means like an average of 1.4 lessons each month. It's more, more than double than the, the other platforms. So uh, I can risk to say that we're doing a great job here at the translations. Um, this is kind of an organic and um, a kind of solid work. Uh, there's some months that are more productive than others. But as I said, it's like a volunteer work. It depends on a lot of um, 
hands to, to put a lesson in the website. So it's like for the author, the translators, the, the reviewers, and the person to put everything online. So at some months, maybe like a, a hiatus for the, for, the, for the work, but it, it's followed right up for uh, months of big production and a mass of um, publications. So uh, in, the f in the last quarter of the 2022, for example, the we got from the hiatus of like two, four or five months, but then we get the, the more uh, average from the old quarters with like almost four lessons published um, each month. So it's like a really solid work that we make. Uh, and the lessons are divided here by uh, kinds of um, lessons, uh, means by which part of the, the, the research are you into. If you uh, are still in the acquiring part of the, the research project, uh, if you're like transforming your data or if you're analyzing it already, if you are going to present it, so it's like the data presentation in there, or to sustain and make data available uh, on, the, on the cloud, on internet in general, so you can filter lessons in the platform as well, looking for which stage of data are you into, and for um, some purpose and f tools and projects that are into. So Python now is the, the main language program, program language that uh, we avail, so with 18 lessons. We have lessons for distant reading, for digital publishing, data manipulation, R as well, which is the second um, language that we use. Uh, we have some lessons for setup as well, for data management, web scraping, leakage, open data, and cartography as well. Uh, and now Juliana is going to, to come back to talk a little bit about uh, the experience of having these lessons and this platform uh, inside of the... Um, um, the classroom, uh, what are the perspective of the, the, the colleagues, uh, the, the, peer, the people that have these lessons in hands to see if it makes impact on the, on the overall um, process of uh, learning and teaching. Okay, so. I'll talk from actually, okay. because I extended myself at the beginning actually. Oh, so uh, we can talk more about this in practice in the Q&A if we want, or over coffee break. Thank you. Yeah. Come back here. <laughs> so let's give a round of applause for Julian and Danielle. And I'll be glad to pass the mic for anyone who wants to pose a few questions. We have plenty of time, I guess. So anyone? Yeah, sure. It's a key, Julie. What thing with um, Hi, thanks. My question is to um, Martina. Um, a very interesting study. I think it's very relevant because of the challenges we have with STEM, even um, in South Africa we have that issue. Um, maybe just a question and some comments. Doing randomized controlled trials in social sciences is not easy. I've been down that path myself. Um, so in terms of the ethics, um, so you have two groups, the control group and the intervention group, and if I understand you correctly, the control group did not get uh, the intervention. Um, I was faced with something sim similar with my chatbot uh, experiment and I was advised that at the end of the experiment I should give the intervention to the control group to keep it fair. So I'm just thinking if you've considered that since this is a pilot and you want to do more of that, would that be something practical and more ethically fair to, to do? I have a second question as well. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So, so, so they don't have to walk with the mic. Um, and then the other, the other um, aspect I was criticized for was something called outcomes expectancy or the nocebo effect. So in, in um, medical trials, there's a placebo. So some the experimental group would get the actual medication and the control group would get a placebo, sugar pill. 
But of course, in social sciences, it's not possible to do that. But there is something called the nocebo effect that sometimes the control group, because they know that they're not getting the intervention, would negatively report on their outcomes. And they would even just do worse in, this, in the tests. And this, even the objective reports would be negative because they know they're not getting the intervention. So I have some suggestions um, that I learned the hard way as well around that. But I'd just like to hear your opinion because that could skew your results quite significantly. Thank you. Anyone else would like to jump in? No? Maybe Martina could answer this one? No, you're not allowed to. No, actually, just to add on some curiosities to his questions, um, I was also wondering if you could talk, uh, tell us more about how the ethical, uh, the, the committee for ethics, and how this conversation with them back and forth happened, what kind of concerns they raised. You mentioned a point, but if you could talk more. Um, and very curious to know what the prize was for students who, who won the hackathon. Um, thank you. And uh, my question for you instead, maybe I do it now and then, uh, for, uh, and then I answer, um, was uh, on the volunteers, how do you incentivize them to actually do the work? And perhaps did you think about students and giving them credits for translations? Just so wondering. And then uh, um, I also had another question for you. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't remember now, but I, I, will, uh, I will come back to that. But yeah, mostly uh, about the volunteers um, part. Um, so answering your questions, fairness. Um, so it it really depends because um, I when I started this RCT, I didn't know anything about RCT, right? So um, I was asked to do the evaluation of the project, and then I, I researched and I, I did qualitative. So I did interviews, focus groups, etc. And then I I decided to do quantitative because speaking with this uh, PhD researchers, they told me that this was the best possible way of measuring the impact, and then. I say let's let's try let's try to do the hardest one and then see what happens. Um, and uh, the first when I, I spoke with some professors asking for suggestions and I told them exactly I asked this I asked how can I make it fair? And uh, for me the answer by one professor was like enlightening because he said what tells you that this courses have a good impact on the students <laughs> like we are giving for granted that joining the activity is good but maybe the time they spend on activity they, they, they don't spend on activities time that they spend doing music or doing sports which is better for the students so we I think when it comes to doing a, um, an experiment you never have to uh, think that your experiment will have a good impact on the students and and if you do that and this is also what I told the students they were telling me they were very interested I told them but maybe, uh, like, this is not necessarily going to be good for you. Maybe if you do other type of projects, they might have an even more positive impact on your, on your future, for example, like uh, music. Uh, but in cases in which they were really interested and they were looking for it, then I told them um, what we did is for some cities in which there was like, some students very interesting, uh, interested in 3D printing, we told them that the next year they could follow the courses. So they had the opportunity when everything ended to then join the activities with the Fab Lab on their personal um, um, yeah, on the personal free time, and so they had the, the opportunity to do that. So there was this opportunity, uh, but um, I didn't encourage it because I would like to do follow-ups in the next years. Uh, so I will also need to exclude those that then end up doing Fab Lab activities. Uh, but overall, I, I think it's it's fair because um, um, we what we did it as part of the credits that schools um, are required to. Um, the students are required to acquire. So in Italy, they have to do 100 hours in, uh, in three years of uh, school work. So they have to go to work somewhere. And most of the time, the school work is like they end up making coffee in some places. So they don't do really great activities. Um, but uh, so this was one of the activities that was offered in these 100 hours. Um, but uh, in the, like, if they don't follow those, they always have some alternative offered. And in some universe, in some schools, it's better than in other schools. But uh, they always have something else that, uh, um, that they could follow. And uh, it, this course doesn't have to be the best opportunity for them. There, there might be other things that they, they might do. I hope this clarifies. Uh, yeah, you never know. Like, 
I also think this is great, but uh, maybe for it could be, for example, that uh, for girls it's too technical, so that they even shy away from STEM. Like I was really open to any result because it, it could be that uh, you found out that for some type of students this type of approach just doesn't work. So we find that it works on average, uh, but we could have found that it doesn't work. So in that case, uh, the students that were in the control group were better, uh, and, uh, yeah, were, were lucky not to be part of this. Like we never had to assume that this is good. And the same for the chatbot. It might be that uh, you, yeah, it's not great. Like you never know. Like it's a, it's a scientific kind of um, uh, rigor to not assume that uh, these things have a positive impact. Um, now, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So now that I have this, like this, this was also what I, we asked for all, to all the schools was a kind of a sacrifice for a better goal because now we have results and we know that this works. So now, thanks to the like the uh, the fact that some students said uh, follow, uh, we can say that these courses have a positive impact. And now, like my work now will be bringing these results to the uh, policymakers ministries, um, writing in newspapers, so that then, thanks to, to this uh, sacrifice this year of the students, then we can hopefully uh, bring this type of approaches in many schools across um, Italy, um, hopefully. So we'll see. But uh, what for sure, what they have been offered to is uh, to join the FabLab activities in the next year. Um, and uh, for the nocebo effect, uh, that's very interesting. I didn't know about this effect. Um, so uh, if there was this, uh, uh, our results are even stronger, right? Because it will be that those that are excluded um, provide. Um, oh no, those, no, no. You say no, no. Right? Uh, it will be, an, yeah. So what I did for those, um, wh what I tried to do is, uh, I noticed that the results, uh, the, the answer of some students were not great in the entry questionnaires when they already had some hints um, at what uh, what could happen. So what I decided to do was to go in person. Uh, to, to administer the questionnaires uh, myself. So I spoke with each of the classes, explaining why this was important, explaining what is an RCT, and why the answers to those that are excluded were especially important. So this is how we did it. And uh, what we noticed is that the quality of the results was much better um, when they had someone in front of them that was saying, we have been working for this for one year. Uh, the, your answers are more important than the answers of those who followed. So please uh, try to be like as precise and uh, as possible. So this this was our way of uh, trying uh, um, to, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's inter I, I, I have to check better uh, to make sure that we don't, are, are not impacted by this uh, nocebo effect. Um, and about uh, ethical approval. So uh, in uh, at the EUI, uh, and I, I think it, it's in many universities, there is a standard process for ethical approval when you do an RCT, an experiment. Um, and uh, uh, so we had to answer a lot of questions about any 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 potential risk for the students because this was the most important thing. And one thing I learned for sure um, was uh, to make them aware of the part, the fact that they were joining the experiment. Uh, uh, the when uh, we started, I thought that it was going to be better not to inform them that they were going to be part because in this way they were more kind of. Uh, yeah, the, 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 there was more uh, independency or um, on, on in the answers. But then the more like the ethical uh, committee uh, sh explained me why it was important for them to be aware. Because if they're aware and they are fully fully aware and also informed of uh, of why we are doing it and why it is important, they can be even more committed in giving good answers. So this is something that I think the main lesson of, from the ethical process is. Uh, to make the subjects aware that they are part of it in a very transparent way. The most, the, yeah, more transparency, the better. <laughs> uh, and this is what we try to do. Uh, and then they told us a lot about uh, data protection. And uh, yeah, there we had a little fight because, for example, they didn't want us to use uh, Google Cloud, uh, but I did my PhD on data transfers. So like Google is definitely safe enough uh, and compliant with GDPR, so at the end they they let us uh, use it uh, because they wanted us to use the cloud of the university. But uh, yeah, so we just uh, went back and forth, and we both learned something from from the process. Um, and then also, the, one of the you asked about prices. One of the things in the ethical approval was about prices and making sure that they are, um, yeah, prices that are. Uh, 
less uh, th those don't create harm in any potential way so for example we we didn't give cash prizes uh, but for example in some in one of the competition was to think about uh, um, a bench design a bench for the park and they were winning um, uh, monopattino will be the how do you say the scooter like electric scooter the small scooter the one uh, electrical scooter but the, the little one like the and so they were li li uh, winning those but uh, the uh, the choice was um, was of the of the fab lab in the play in the specific city and what is interesting is that we uh, I also asked to the students in the in, the, in my interviews I interviewed like 200 students in total and uh, they say that uh, for the prize some students were decided not to join the competition because they were not interested in the prize. So the prize, you really have to know who, is this, who are the students that are joining because for some of them the prize creates, creates also anxiety and they are not interested in it. So if there is no prize, maybe they even follow the activity with more interest. Um, so you really have to study, like uh, learn about them and maybe ask them. Uh, th like and this is more qualitative, but uh, what I learned from this, uh, from, from this whole exercise is that uh, the students often know much better than the trainers what they want to learn, how they want to learn, and what they like and don't like. So what I, what my first lesson and what I told to each of the trainers is before you even think about designing a course, talk with the students and ask them what they would like, uh, and then design this, the, the course with them based on their interests. And yeah, so, so um, and, and the prices are part of the question you can ask them, like if they would be interested or not. Uh, in Sicily, what we did is uh, very small prices for sports equipment, for example. Um, so it depends on, on what they are interested in. Uh, and then, yeah, I think I reply to everything. Thank you. Uh, Juliana, would you like to talk a little bit about the results and I have a for yes yeah. uh, so we are at that moment where we're talking with students to learn uh, how this could work better too so they can uh, contribute to the, to the research design so what we did is that we have a 60 hour mandatory course in the first that we offer for first year students in social sciences uh, which is called uh, data data analysis lab and we are applying a bunch of program of the programming historians lessons in this course uh, there is a survey at the beginning before they start uh, the classes and there is a survey at the end the focus groups at the end so you understand what they think of the lessons, um, what were their expectations in relation with um, um, yeah, with learning digital skills or computational methods. And of course, we're just starting, we did that with one uh, group of students uh, last year. And Portugal, uh, uh, the, our, our colleagues at NOVA are doing the same with their students. And in terms of the curriculum here, we have um, five mandatory methodological courses, but not all of them will necessarily uh, tackle digital tools or computational methods, but uh, for sure 180 hours of training of that kind they have during their undergraduate course here. Uh, but this, yeah, it depends on who is teaching those courses, so we're concentrating on this data analysis lab that it's either Swami, so Jimmy, or me giving it, um, so we can participate with students and during the course uh, talk to them about the lessons. And one thing that was very interesting is that uh, we thought the lessons were maybe too short and maybe too superficial. And they thought the opposite. Oh, it's such a long lesson. <laughs> uh, so we're just, um, yeah, taking notes about how they react to the, the, the platform because although it's been a while that it's out and lots of people use it uh, we haven't seen it's to our knowledge there aren't other studies about how really students are reacting to the material that we voluntarily are uh, putting there so um, it's our first try um, let me see what else many of the students in our case like most of them actually reported they did not know exactly how a computer worked. They had no idea what computational thinking would mean. 
Um, they had never even seen the programming language. They didn't know their names, what R is, what Python is, Julia, or some other languages. So everything was not at all familiar to our students. That was a surprise for us because we're all this generation, they're born with computers, but it's not the case. Like the fact that you use apps on your phone all the time, it doesn't mean <laughs> that you have a bunch of skills and, and prior basic information that are uh, foundational for this kind of courses. So yeah, it's very ongoing, very new. And I'm ha very happy to learn about the short grid score and the PISA crea creative thinking framework because we can definitely look uh, for those materials and inspire ourselves to, to, the, to this research design that we're thinking for the second phase of the project, what we are actually interacting with students. Uh, so I think that's it for now, and Danielle could talk a little bit more about the volunteer work. Of course. Uh, answering you, Martina, uh, about the, the challenge of getting some volunteers to work within the platform. I think the first challenge for us is to make the platform itself known by students and scholars, because it's not well known by now. Uh, the project has already, already 15 years on air, but in Brazil it's since 2021, so it's like two years on the air only. Uh, one of them was in like a pandemic context, which makes everything a little bit more difficult as well uh, for sharing information and uh, make the, this academic projects known by students. So I think the, the first uh, challenge will be there. Uh, but then uh, we see that we have a, a movement of digital humanists that they make lessons. Uh, they make like tutorials, they make posts, they make uh, code snippets, but they make in other platforms. They make it on LinkedIn, they make it on Medium, they make it on their own blogs. Uh, and the work that we need to, to make right now, it's... Uh, see, take this, this sea of information and brings it to Programming Historian because the information is there and there's a lot of the advantage to have those lessons that are published anywhere inside the, the Programming Historian for the students itself. Uh, for example, uh, if you post an, a lesson on Programming Historian for a student, it, it becomes part of their academic resume, the, the Lattice uh, uh, platform. So it's better for them to have a lesson published there than on a, a regular blog, for example. Uh, each lesson has a DOI, the Digital Object Identificator, as well. So um, there's, there's revisors for the lessons as well, so it's more um, academic and scientific accurate. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages that we make to make uh, students uh, understand uh, that are better for them to have their lessons within the, the digital programming historian um, platform than in other other place, places. But first, we need to make the, the platform known. So we're sharing the platform among students uh, as widely as possible. And then um, we're trying to, to seek for this content in the, in, the web, in the web that already have and make the, the platform known for for those students to bring their content inside the platform. Uh, I'd like to add something that, like, so these, we have been investing in organizing a lot of events so to let people know, and I didn't mention before, but we are partnering with NOVA uh, in Lisbon, but there are other institutions in Brazil who later joined because we're forming this network. So we don't have a network or a working association of digital humanists here, for example. But so we are really relying on our personal network, basically, to reach out to colleagues who we know, whom we know are working with, uh, uh, have their own research centers or research groups. And so there's there are people uh, collaborating from the University of uh, Federal University of Bahia in northern uh, northern Brazil. Uh, and other places, uh, in Sao Paulo too, at Unes Unifesp, uh, with the Federal University of Sao Paulo. So this is our, our way of expanding <laughs> the, the uh, collaboration. And really there, there aren't any more incentives than those, like the, 
you can have this, this a peer-reviewed publication in the end. Um, yeah, we have these different policies to try to reach out different groups. But we are open except to recommendations, suggestions, of course. Thank you, Julian. Do we have more questions from the floor? No? Maybe before the break, I can just ask Juliana, uh, you were dealing with students from FGV. Uh, and our social science degree here, it's a very small degree, right? With very few students. So how do you relate these findings with the broader universe of social, social science students in Brazil? No? Do, do you have any inferences from others' experiences in Bahia or in Sao Paulo that you can like, generalize something about that? And so, Martina, I was wondering, you are measuring highly sophisticated skills, right? Creativity, um, flexibility, et cetera, social skills, cognitive skills. And you are using tests and the experiments. But at some point in your presentation, and I guess in your paper as well, you, you mentioned some qualitative uh, studies that you could do. Like, for instance, in the midterm, is it possible to follow a few students throughout their s school's trajectory to check whether these skills hold, you know, because w once you take part in a, this is very exciting, and if I would report myself after that, I would say, of course, I, I want to do engineering, <laughs> you know, uh, I would be excited, but what about in the midterm, in, in the, during their school's uh, itinerary? So maybe doing some interviews or interviews with the teachers to see if the, the, this, these skills are employed in class, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, also, okay. Um, so yeah, like for those who doesn't know, like FGV is a, a non-profit organization, but still a private organization. And actually most, most social scientists and historian students in Brazil are in public universities, I think I can say that. And in computational infrastructure, even access to high-speed internet, all that varies a lot uh, among uh, institutions. And, but we were quite surprised to learn that our students, differently from what we thought, had a very little experience. And uh, like they used the internet all the time on their phones. They had the computers at home. This is not always the case for students in other institutions, but um, that didn't mean that they had more experience in how the computer thinks or how machine works and with these other digital um, uh, resources that they could have at hand to, to learn, to do their research. So this was, I think that in in a larger scale that would be even harder or more difficult to find in other institutions. And all the time with the, uh, the results, uh, the, the survey results with the coordinators, uh, they were, yeah, shocking because they don't even have internet sometimes available in their institutions or a lab available with computers. So it's hard to think of teaching and uh, using these tools if you don't even have the material, the infrastructure there. Um, but yeah, but, uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but uh, that's it. Um, well, regarding uh, midterm, yes, our idea is to follow up. Um, so we asked also in the in the data protection thing that they had to sign, um, we asked uh, to keep the data for up to five years to be able to follow up. So this is uh, something we have. We have their permission, but then it will depend on, so on the schools to give us access to their emails. But in, on paper, because uh, according to GDPR, you have to have a written uh, <laughs> consent. So we have on paper, you have like a, a pile of uh, um, liberatory in Italian, so it would be like consent forms in which I have their numbers, the emails and stuff, uh, which is uh, very unsafe from a per data protection perspective, I think, but that's what they asked us to do. So I could potentially follow up with all of them. But, um, so on this, on this uh, specific study. But what I can tell you is that um, I, I've, I've been doing this for eight years now with my own NGO. Um, so, and the reason why I wanted to, to, to do this more 
um, scientific experiment is that what I saw from an anecdotal pers like, uh, point of view, so just uh, talking with my students, is that uh, um, in general, this approach, so the creative learning approach is an approach that I think should, should be applied in all schools because it is just an approach that uh, interests all students and especially uh, clicks something on those students that don't like traditional education, like this front education, it just doesn't work. Um, um, in, and, and we know it also in Italy, we have also the national plan on education. And I think everybody is aware that frontal education just is not the best way of teaching and that you need a creative approach, group work, all these kind of things. And a lot of people are trying to do it uh, in schools. Um, but uh, yeah, Fab Labs are really, I think, um, s some, like some organizations that are really putting this in practice. And there is also an history of 20 years. So we learned uh, by doing and, and, and we really apply this fully. Um, so in general, I think this approach works if you want to especially stimulate uh, students that don't like traditional learning and also students uh, to, to, to train those um, like creativity, group work, leadership, communication, all those skills that schools are not really um, training f uh, students for today. So there's really like this big gap. Um, and. Uh, of course, um, you don't change the directory of, uh, direction of all students, but I can tell you that uh, every week I have one student that writes back to me and tells me, thanks for what we did five years ago, now I enroll to STEM, now I'm a computer engineer, now I feel fulfilled, I'm doing um, uh, entrepreneurship. So we have uh, people in Sicily that started uh, startups, they created companies, and this is extremely rare. Like uh, what I ask to students when I first go to a school is who of them wants to become an entrepreneur, and there's no end raised ever. Like there's no interest in being entrepreneurs in Sicily, uh, but um, we have many students that follow our activities that now are um, start um, digital entrepreneurs. So for sure there is an impact. Um, and now we are trying to finally estimate it more like scientifically, but uh, it seems, yeah. But we will follow up in the long term. Just to Thank you, Martina, Juliana, Daniel. So I guess now it's the time to close our round table and invite people. Do we have a break, uh, snacks and ref a coffee break outside? So thank everybody for being here. And uh, just a f final question. Am I the only one who is freezing here? <laughs> uh, that's my suggestion for late uh, uh, to adjust the, the air conditioning. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you.
Hello. May we start? Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, people here that are going to present. Um, welcome to Roundtable 5, Digital Frameworks for Data-Driven Research. My name is Yuna Fontora. I'm professor from the Brazilian School of Business and Public Administration of FGV. It's called IBAPI. So it's the Business and Administration School from Rio, and then we have a sister in Sao Paulo, which is AISP. Um, so I work there, and I, I've been kindly invited to join you in this conference by Juliana, and I'm happy to be here. So I hope I can contribute to, from my qualitative uh, background, but also from my research background, to your paper development, and, and, and also for brainstorming ideas and exchange some, possible, some possibilities regarding your theme and your uh, ongoing research. Okay, so my question is, do you have presentations? Have you already sent? Okay, so um, I, I've planned around 20 minutes presentation maximum for each. Unfortunately, one of the participants hasn't come, um, so, but it's good in the sense that we have more time. So I believe 15 minutes is good, but you can go to 20 minutes, okay? And then I have comments for each paper, or each work in progress, uh, and then we open to the audience, and then maybe we can sum up each paper separately, and then in the end I can make a, a, a sum up. What, is that fine? Is that fine? Perfect, okay. So let's start, yeah, Ivan, please. Thank you. Okay, it works. So, um, my name is Ivan Prostakov, I'm from uh, HEC University in Moscow, Russia, and uh, uh, probably my speech will be more not on a uh, specific uh, topic of uh, research. I would like to explain also different approaches to different researches that we uh, do in, uh, in, uh, in my university and uh, particularly in the Graduate School of uh, Business. Um, I would like uh, mostly uh, to uh, launch also a kind of exchange of ideas uh, in some provocative way, maybe as we started the first day. Uh, and uh, when uh, I decided to participate as speaker, uh, the first idea that I had that uh, we continue to think about and uh, to think on so-called uh, uh, Polanyi's paradox. Polanyi, Michael Polanyi was a uh, uh, Hungarian and um, British philosopher, uh, but also scientist, researcher in different fields. And uh, one of topic he studied and uh, he launched in a book of uh, 60s, 1960s, was so called paradox, his paradox, called Paulanis paradox, but another person, another man, researcher, um, American economist, author, um, that uh, we can know more than we can tell. Uh, the idea of Paulani was uh, that uh, uh, in uh, everyday life or in uh, research, uh, scientific research, we cannot uh, verbalize all our knowledge. And in fact, uh, this uh, paradox, Polanyi paradox, is uh, now mostly used and uh, debated uh, uh, in the framework of uh, uh, different um, studies on, AI, uh, on artificial intelligence, first of all. Uh, so, I would like to start with uh, this Polanyi paradox. Uh, uh, 
um, uh, in the context of uh, a specific field of uh, research and education that we develop and uh, that we all know, but probably using different terms for it, the so-called uh, uh, business uh, uh, information, information science. Um, actually, uh, as I work uh, now mainly uh, in the framework of uh, Graduate School of uh, Business and uh, many of uh, uh, universities, uh, members of uh, Social Sciences University Network are business school of, or uh, have business school uh, in, uh, inside the university, I suppose uh, it's also an interesting topic to be developed uh, together. Um, and uh, when we talk about business and management, and uh, uh, first of all, when we talk about uh, um, uh, strategic or, or operational management, <coughs> when the main task is the decision making, <coughs> decision making for a firm, for a corporation, or even for uh, the university, of course, uh, the starting point of, uh, for uh, this uh, decision making is uh, uh, collecting and uh, analyzing information and information to transform information in data. It means uh, to process, to organize th this information. Uh, and uh, uh, finally now, we uh, work more and more than in the framework of uh, combination of management studies, traditional management studies and uh, informational, uh, information science and uh, technologies. Uh, it uh, leads us to so-called business information science, or that we call in Russia business informatics, BI, uh, the term that we directly borrow it uh, from our German colleagues. Uh, and uh, I would say, as in many other fields, we have uh, uh, two types of uh, uh, definitions and names, the continental European business informatics and uh, the American one, I don't know if in Brazil uh, it's mostly uh, repented to this one, the American US uh, information systems. But you may imagine, uh, starting from differences in the names, that we also have a little bit different concepts of uh, business informatics and uh, information uh, systems. Uh, Business informatics is not be confused with data science and data analytics because it's wider, it's broader. And first of all, because uh, it includes many social sciences. We are always in the uh, framework of social sciences uh, uh, and uh, which uh, um, uh, concern uh, all of us. Uh, as a result, um, universities, many universities, uh, are moving toward uh, a creation of clusters around business informatics, clusters of education and uh, research with uh, an important interdisciplinary component. Uh, if we talk about Russia, for us this science, this field is quite new. This year will officially celebrate, I would say, the 20th anniversary of, uh, 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 of the creation, 1993, not, uh, I'm sorry, it's 2003. So we work officially in the field of business informatics only uh, for 20 years. That means in 20 years ago, uh, business informatics was recognized uh, and was codified by the Ministry of uh, Higher Education and Research as a field of education and uh, research. And now, with an incredibly uh, steady growth, we have uh, business informatics and uh, as a st field of study and uh, scientific research in almost 180 universities of Russia. And uh, I show here also the incredible increasing of enrollment in our university and in our business school exactly for the cluster of business informatics, knowing that uh, with, uh, in this cluster we have only four programs and a cluster of uh, management eight programs. Uh, the number of students, of uh, graduated students in the field of business informatics uh, 
practically doubled uh, in uh, only uh, four years. Um, what kind of research and what kind of uh, uh, ideas we can share and we can offer to uh, our partners uh, in Russia and uh, outside? I would like to mention on the couple of uh, recent uh, uh, papers and recent research uh, researches uh, of the last uh, year uh, accessible and uh, um, uh, published. Um, knowing that this popularity of business informatics is also um, um, linked to the fact of this, uh, the creation of completely new fields for business and management, uh, like uh, uh, data mining and business analytics, or a digital economy, or uh, uh, data security management, uh, digital engineering management, and so on and so on. Fails uh, quite new and uh, uh, very attractive for uh, students uh, uh, who uh, understand that uh, uh, data analysis, uh, uh, but with uh, um, in in a very applied uh, way, will be. Uh, demanded by the labor market and by enterprises, but it offers also many fields of new research and new uh, research activities. Uh, as I mentioned, a couple of examples. The first one is uh, on uh, uh, study on bankruptcy, bankruptcy factors. So um, business informatics with a lot of data which we can analyze uh, and uh, to create an adoptive structure for it may even predict some economic uh, phenomenon uh, at the level of different enterprises. Uh, it is a paper of my uh, colleagues uh, from HEC uh, University. They analyzed almost 400 Russian enterprises, uh, defined three important uh, factors which affects uh, and with which uh, increase, which affects uh, enterprises and which increase the risk of bankruptcy. And uh, the main findings are here. So for Russian enterprises uh, at the st stage of growth, the main factor of risk is uh, the external uh, um, environment. Even uh, the financial management uh, count too, but what is interesting is that corporate governance is less important than two other factors. Uh, obviously, uh, the research was done uh, on the basis of uh, uh, Russia, uh, Russian economy, uh, but it could be interesting also to probably to launch a common uh, uh, joint research uh, on uh, other emerging markets, because uh, Russia is an emerging mar market first, an emerging market with a strong presence of the government. Uh, in our network, we have also countries with a similar uh, situation, and uh, probably it could be also an issue to, to see uh, together. Uh, another point uh, also recently published in the uh, book Digital Transformation and New Challenges, uh, uh, in fact it was uh, a compendium of uh, different articles, uh, uh, issues of uh, different conferences on uh, uh, the development of uh, pan post-pandemic uh, world and in fact business informatics is very active in uh, uh, analyzing what uh, happened during pandemic and after, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't notice that I don't uh, don't show you the presentation. So uh, <laughs> this one is, uh, as I said, uh, the number of students that we enroll on business informatics, and uh, you may see the incredible growth of it. Uh, different new fields of uh, research and education for. Uh, management um, is much broader than uh, previously. Uh, 
this is the article with the possibility also to visit it on, uh, uh, on uh, web uh, uh, on the bankruptcy factors. And as I said, the main factors uh, are my colleagues uh, um, have uh, uh, analyzed uh, external environment, the financial management and corporate governance. And the external uh, environment was uh, most important when we consider the risk of uh, uh, bankruptcy for uh, Russian uh, companies. But uh, as I uh, said, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, this uh, uh, research could be extended. And uh, the other example of uh, research also involving business informatics, uh, it's quite, uh, it's very wide because we have uh, here in this in this uh, uh, book, uh, many articles also on uh, uh, management in the field of medicine, for example, um, with the starting point of uh, pandemic, but not only medicine, not only pandemic, but also collateral uh, uh, topics. And uh, one of them, I found it very interesting, is the vision of students of their professional activities of, uh, in the industry for uh, zero. And uh, probably um, the result that we have also with uh, the analysis of uh, several thousand of uh, Russian students, it's uh, quite, uh, um, it's, it's also a kind of paradox because we uh, have uh, seen that uh, uh, business informatics and uh, it means that data science too are uh, very requested by students, but at the same time, we see in Russia that many of them are not sufficiently informed uh, about uh, innovative uh, processes in their own uh, sphere of uh, education. Uh, I suppose that uh, this topic is also a bo broad and uh, um, uh, interesting topic for uh, other countries and other institutions uh, uh, as uh, the professional uh, orientation of our students uh, is uh, very important uh, in order to be much, much more attractive and to offer uh, much more possibilities. So, uh, finally, um, uh, probably we may continue to discuss if uh, business informatics in, in, and in fact, not only business informatics, but the data science overall uh, will allow us to tell all what we may know. But uh, uh, my impression that uh, in any case, we uh, are not uh, in the, the stage when uh, um, soft skills and the previous experience of uh, human beings, uh, which remain crucial assets, not only data, not only information, but only also these uh, uh, moments are cr uh, crucial assets for decision making and decision making at the corporate level, but also at the university's level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan, from your presentation. Um, we are in the same field, it's the business management field of research, although not in the same subfield, the operational management, but yeah, we are in the business school. And in business school, nowadays are rethinking their role in this data-driven society and how to prepare students for this future. So. Here I have a few comments for, from your paper, and then I encourage you to contribute as well. Here in Brazil, uh, I, I know the, the confusion that all those names can, can make, but usually we take more information science and technology. Uh, but again, uh, we see this issue as a transversal issue that is not only taken by business schools. I know that you're talking about business and informatics, um, but here, uh, so from my experience in FGV and also for, for what I've seen in, in science in Brazil, is that 
uh, this is a transversal issue that almost every curriculum shall engage in, in, in some way. So from the computer engineering to the mathematics to social sciences to business and so on. Um, and this makes us uh, reflect about the curriculum, okay? So, I have some, some provocative <laughs> reflections to you. Um, first, um, the first one is for the, the, the paper that you brought that talked about the financial market and the, and the results of the paper. The paper showed the significant impact of the institutional environment of Russia. So one contribution that I have is that we need further studies and comparable case studies, not only in the financial sector, but also in terms of the institutional environment of this data science that we have nowadays. Of course, we know that doing business in Russia has this some specificities and also doing business in Brazil and in India and so on. And unfortunately, our field is very westernized, very Eurocentric, uh, Anglo-Saxon um, mainstream. And then we miss more reflection in the institutional environment. So I would encourage you to engage in institutional in this institutional uh, aspect of this research, but moving from the, the financial market and maybe reflecting uh, on different businesses, different types of corporations, but also considering that you are the vice director of the school, I believe that you're also curious about the, the, the business school's curriculum. So, maybe you could make this comparison so how well is business school curriculum or not well well is much here um, is, is more into judgment but how is the curriculum of business schools and our social social sciences schools moving or in the economics moving f forward in this issue so this could be interesting and if this curriculum suits the institutional context or not uh, or is just a package that we receive and then we just Im impose to to our students. So this is something that uh, I would provoke you. And the second, the second one is about the post-pandemic situation. I think it's very interesting to reflect about data-driven society and post-pandemic world. And yes, we must rely in the digital in many aspects in our lives. Um, but one of the questions that I have and I, I pose it to you is how can we avoid disasters <laughs> through this type of data? So it seems to me that we live in a world full of this da data from every kind and every source. But not, a, not only I don't know how to manage this in the terms of decision making and strategically speaking, as you're saying, but also how this data can avoid disasters such as the, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So this is something that I have to you uh, considering the challenges that we have. So this digital, uh, I, I mean, in other words, digital is a way, but maybe not a solution. They're also talking about people here, actions, policies, decision. So this is something that maybe could be a, another way to develop your, your thoughts. And, and the third, thing that you you mentioned is the industry 4.0 uh, and the vision of students of their professional activities in this industry so the reflection again about the career of the business students I mean business because they know that you're in this field but the, the future 
uh, of the undergraduate career in, as a whole, considering this new uh, artificial intelligence, data-driven society, and so on. Um, so, one question that I have is, what is the impact of this Industry 4.0 in management career? I know that from my students, from my master's students, that they are very interested in researching leadership. Uh, and for instance, leadership in artificial intelligence, or uh, they, they are afraid about losing their jobs, so job replacement for the technology. Also, um, content creation, decision making, so the machine is much smarter in, in, in different senses to make decisions. But how fair is that? I mean, how uh, is this new future? Um, and I'm not trying here to be, uh, how can I say, I, I, I'm not being very pessimistic about the, the, this is the society because I know th this is the future. But how can we reflect about the future of management and business career, considering all those challenges of the organization, organizational environment that we all work on? Um, so again, how to prepare our students to that and using your own words and then you're talking about human beings and human beings we, when we talk about human beings we talk about teamwork we talk about behavior uh, motivation happiness and this kind of things so this is something that uh, i would provoke you i know that it's not in operational management <laughs> uh, field but something for us to reflect together here in this moment so I open to your answers, and then they can encourage people to join us. OK, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for your questions and comments. Uh, they are very wide, and uh, I'm afraid I could speak for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to be very short. The first point, inst uh, institutional aspects in the curriculum. Um, uh, um, in my opinion, it's mostly in uh, presence, not in business and management, but in other fields, first, uh, first of all economics. But in business and management, it will become more and more present. And uh, I would like also to combine this point with another question you raised. Uh, including also the impact of uh, Industry 4.0 and uh, um, uh, students' career, how to uh, guarantee more, I would say, stability for them and clarity in the vision of uh, the future. Uh, we discussed, uh, in fact, yesterday, we would like to, to go with uh, this topic uh, of uh, sustainable development. So uh, when we talk about the uh, institutional aspects now, uh, management uh, is crucial also to include, and we do, the topic of sustainable development in, the particular, uh, in particular for the management ESG agenda, which allows to have uh, uh, an institutional presence in the curriculum. And the f second, thank you. The second, to uh, explain to our students how to move in the uh, present environment. Because uh, Industry 4.0 uh, is impossible without the implementation of uh, sustainability and uh, of uh, ESG uh, principles. Um, how to avoid uh, disasters? 
uh, one million questions. Probably it's a question, provocative question for all of us. I'm not a specialist in black swans, but probably disasters uh, uh, such as bankruptcy and massive bankruptcy, as I showed, could be predicted in some way using exactly business informatics or if we call it uh, informational systems. Um, actually, I'm ready to talk a lot about it, but I wouldn't uh, uh, occupy all the time that we have for our session. It will remain some time. We can, we can continue, and I can continue also in bilateral dialogue with uh, people present in this room. Thank you. You're welcome. So I open for... For the questions, someone, so do you have any questions? To even, no? Anyone from the audience? No? Okay. So thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, let's clap hands. Um, so now let me kindly invite Adelina. Nina, sorry, the three co authors. And Nina, please feel free to present. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nina Carneiro. I work as an analyst of documentation and information at CPDOC's oral history program and the Center of Audiovisual and Documentary. I'm going to read this, but I'm going to try to look at you guys in the eyes. <laughs> I'm here to present a little of our initiative called Rede de Arquivos de Mulheres, or Women's Archive Network. I use here the term network for a lack of a better term in, for this translation in English. But it is a network in the terms of uh, collaboration and integration between institutions. Uh, alongside with my colleagues, uh, Adelina Novaes Cruz, who is here, <laughs> and Carolina Alves, who could not attend, who both work at CEPEDOC's personal archive program. We hope to show you what motivated the founding of REM, the Rede de Arquivos de Mulheres, and how you use digital tools to improve and expand the possibilities of the network. Uh, when we talk about historical documents in our archives, we must understand that they reflect the society where they were produced, both in terms of social economic conditions and of historical context. What we choose to guard, preserve, and provide access to is formed by a series of choices that many times reflects the hegemonic narratives of the periods of their production. We as researchers and professionals that work on archives and uh, make use of them in our day-to-day -day researches, whether it be in the academic publications, academic researches in all these fields, have to understand these questions when we talk and work with this type of documents. Okay, sorry. <laughs> In archives, in many instances, we see a lack of documents that reflects the trajectory of women in different areas of society, such as politics, science, sports, and even culture. This is especially true when we think of late 19th century and to mid-30s documents, which is the case of Sepedoki where we work, so we are very familiar with these types of documents. A time when women were largely excluded from participating in public life. But just because we don't have these records in an official manner, in the hegemonic narratives that we are accustomed to, it doesn't mean that women didn't play an important role in society. The challenge here is to think differently about how we can break the silence of archives, like Michel Perrault, an academic that deals with these uh, types of things, call it. About rent specifically. These were the main questions that were the basis for the conce conception of the network, a wish not only to discover these stories, but also to think in new ways of how we can present them and give access to these documents. 
Rent was created in November of 2020 amidst the social distancing imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic to discuss the absence and silence in women's archives in an effort to make visible the historical documents of and about women, including collectives, movements, and feminist associations. And to think of the impact that the studies of gender and feminists have had in archival practice. The founding institutions were CEPEDOC and IEB, the Institute of Brazilian Studies from the University of Sao Paulo. Oh yeah, yeah, just uh, thinking connected, it's important. For this, we did a mapping of the women's archives that were presented in both of these institutions. This is here, so you can see. On the further upside, it's IEB, and downside is FGV CPDOC. Uh, just for the record, uh, since then, the, I think this study was made in 2020 or 2021, I don't recall it, but uh, there have been more uh, archives of women that have come to CPDOC ever si since then, showing a growing concern in the collecting and preserving of these types of collections. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, all in all, at that time, we had 35 archives, 35 collections, sorry. After some internal discussions and the establishment of the structure of the network, we made our first external event in February of 2021 in contact with two other Brazilian institutions, Brazil's National Archive and the Moreira Salles Institutes, by means of the researchers. An uh, interesting fact that uh, many of these researchers are women. One of the main aspects of this network, besides the fact that it has a collaborative nature between different institutions, is that it was created in a context we are confined in our homes, working remotely because of the pandemic situation. This had a direct impact in terms of routine and work practice, and the archival institutions had to rethink and readjust their activities. And this was directly reflected on the way we think and discuss the question of access to our documents, especially in their digital form. The debates about digitization and circulation of archival documents by means of digital repositories, search engines, websites, social media, among others, has long been gaining attention in recent years. But after 2020, it became a center point of importance to archival workers, considering the context of pandemic the possibilities that the digital form offers brought a new array of questions in terms of accessibility, new ways to visualize and research in archives, and new configurations of inter-institutional collaboration going beyond geographical limits. These are just some examples of uh, events we did in the context of REM, and uh, for those who cannot read Portuguese, they were all uh, made online via Zoom or other platforms, you know, showing uh, these um, possibilities that the digital can offer in terms of integrating different researchers from different states of Brazil, for instance. One of RAM initiatives, and the one that we're talking about here, was the creation of a website developed by a team of students of CEPEDOC, amazing ones. Uh, that uh, I'm sorry. Now, developed by a team of students of CEPEDOC that presents the main activities of REM, its meetings, publications, videos, seminars, making possible that more people knew the goals and objectives of this collaborative network. By using a digital tool called Wix, which is an open source project developed by Microsoft, but it uses common license, <laughs> it's important, and it uses HTML to construct its content in a friendly user, uh, in a friendly, uh, it's a friendly tool for people that are not so familiar with uh, 
more complex coding uh, uh, tools, coding language, sorry. RAM's website aims to use the digital environment as a way to expand the debates and knowledge about women's archive in Brazil. We hope to reach a new set of people that are interested and in research these themes, whether they are individual researchers in terms of their, I don't know, maybe academic interests, or e even uh, in terms of other institutions that have larger or even small collections of women in their archives. So it can be either in the individual form or via collective like institution. In terms of future challenges, I believe that there are two main aspects that we need to focus in order to continue and expand RAM. Just showing the website here. One is how to maintain not only the website updated with our activities, but how to combine our day-to-day -day work routine with the effort to support a collaborative network like RAM. After 2022, if you can say uh, a post-pandemic world, archives resume many of their user practice, and this had a direct impact in the activities that were elaborated during the pandemic having in mind those const the constrictions of the time. How to combine a new normal with our old normal <laughs> is one of the challenges that we are facing nowadays. The other question, and one that this event highlights, is the effort to think in a more global manner, to try to bring researchers from other countries and get to know RAM and our objectives. Currently, the website is available only in Portuguese, which constricts its users to speakers of the language, mainly in Brazil and Portugal. Uh, we hope to translate it in Spanish and English in the hopes that it helps attract a new set of researchers that can add and reach the objectives of RAM. Uh, can we show the website now? Just a little bit? Oh, okay. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, so this is it. Uh, it was made, uh, like I said, with our students. So it has a very, um, uh, oh, how can I say it? Uh, it was easy to do it. You know, they are students of social science. They don't have no uh, specific knowledge of uh, coding or, or computer or science. And, but they made one that is very, I, I think so, very visually appealing and uh, easy to navigate because one of the objectives is to attract more people. So if you can see, there's a like, Fale Conosco, talk with us. If you people are interested in joining RAM, they can just go to the website and send directly an email uh, expressing their interest in to get to know more about the network or maybe even join them. So it was very important that it was a very clear website that has a concise language. Yeah, here. And uh, can we just... Uh, oh, okay. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nina for a very good presentation. I really like this, this work in progress, a research presentation, archival presentation. Uh, first of all, because I'm a qualitative uh, researcher, uh, but also because I, I really believe that we should unhide the silenced voice of women. So this is one of my uh, flagships, let's say. So, I really liked your work, and I have some reflections again for you. So one is that this is it, it's very important for us to move beyond traditional history, and moving beyond this traditional, I would say traditional male top-down history. How can I say that? Uh, when I say male, is because it's very male-based and male-developed not through male researchers, but also uh, the, the traditional history has uh, as the core in the past, mostly in the past, but till nowadays we, we still see some studies in this way, that the main history or the, the truth in terms of history is the history of the big men or big representations of male personalities, male, male people. 
And this is quite problematic, not only because we bring biases with this uh, type of memory, but also because we uh, hide uh, other perspectives of the real life. And somehow this has uh, actions uh, in, different, in different senses, uh, considering, for instance, the way we see reality. Because w what we have as core in history is that history, knowing history, learning through history, and not only uh, good experiences, but also mistakes and what happened in history is very good for us to avoid problems in the future, but also to think about our present life. And in this post-truth society, what we see, uh, and especially for instance in Brazil in the last years, is that uh, we have, people have claimed that the history has been manipulated Brazilian history has been manipulated, not only Brazilian, but worldwide history, but talking about our locus of financiation. And we see a, a, a recreation of history movement from part of some, for some groups of the society. And this is quite problematic because uh, who is leading this recreation and what is the effect of this rethink of history? Is it to uh, not take responsibility for past mistakes or for what happened? But, but also is it a way to manipulate the present as well? Uh, so this is something that I think it's very important to reflect. So moving beyond the traditional history. And through this archive that Sepedoki produced, we can think otherwise, or think history otherwise, think history from the bottom, from the memory of people, in or ordinary people, I'd say, and not famous leaders, but ordinary people from society, and you should learn from this. This is a very important histo history that we've been neglected for, for years. And I think that the role of Sepedoc is very important to that, so uh, I think this is amazing. And talking about Perrault's quotation, the, the silence of the archivists, and I, I thought that maybe that I just put it right now is that the silence of the archive somehow is the silence of marginalized people or marginal people. As marginal people weren't there in history, as they were taken into consideration in a way that when writing about history, let's not take the marginals into consideration. And this is very problematic. Uh, and if you think about the amount of data that we have and the potential of data that we have from the, these women archives, we can uh, critically reflect not only about the role of women and marginal women, uh, but why we live in this complex society that we have that does not empower women um, in a way that should be. Uh, so this is something that uh, I'd like to, to comment. Um, and then the importance of digitalization for human history. So at the end is digitalization allowing women's history empowerment. So this is important and representativeness. Uh, so, um, I, I had a few questions, but uh, the other comment that I had was that somehow in academia we can reproduce inequality through our research. 
and through this women network archive we can also not reproduce or reflect from the border uh, the border of the academia mainstream this is important even if here at FGV and I thought about asking about the main challenge that you had in order to produce this archive but then you said so and then I said oh, let me move it so my my question I have two questions to conclude is that do you be, do you think that is good to produce a paper maybe explaining how did you start and all this challenge that you had and the methodology itself not only for people in history and social science but for people that works with methodology research so this could be nice I, I believe uh, a, a way that you can use this material for researchers that Maybe you can explain the whole process uh, of implementing this archive and digitalization. So it's like the combination of digitalization, archive methodology, and history from the bottom, or rethink history. So this is a very nice paper. I would like to read it. So this is something that uh, uh, I think that maybe so if you have plans or what do you think? Um, and the other one was about the internationalization, but then you said so that you're moving to translate the archive to Spanish and English. So that, that these are my comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yuna, for your comments. Uh, I would like to say that uh, these stories, they all have always been there, you know? Uh, that's the main thing, I think, that in the recent years, archives have been looking um, each time more about these stories and how we can uh, make them more visible, you know? Because, like you said, uh, archives are very powerful institutions in terms of what kind of, what kind of a history we are not only preserving, but we are showing. So uh, the, the notion that these stories have always been there and it's very important that we uh, make them each time more the, the basis maybe of our work, of uh, what we prioritize you know, in terms of uh, what we give access and even sometimes what we digitize. You know, because when we talk about the digital, especially in terms of, of countries like uh, Brazil or we call it uh, not maybe countries like uh, in Europe or the U U.S. where they have more money or more infrastructure, you know, not only to digitize but to make these uh, types of documents uh, preserved in a digital form. Uh, in Brazil, sometimes we have to choose what we call what we put it on digital. And these types of decisions, they are very also some political, you know. So uh, these, the way that the archives are dealing with the, the importance of these types of documents is very important in uh, these uh, this kind of days. And um, also to say that it's at Sapedoki we have uh, mainly documents, li like I said, from the 1930s and now more recent. But it's mainly um, upper class, uh, in terms of woman, of course, upper, upper class uh, white woman. So that's uh, also one of the things that we are trying to, to, to talk about, you know? What are these kinds of archives? What are the, those archives that are being processed and, and preserved? And there have been a lot of... Um, community archives that are centered in maybe in indigenous stories, um, LGBTQ communities also, uh, African Brazilians uh, archives. They are going exactly in what you said, that uh, the importance of bringing those stories to the forefront, especially in recent years that w we, we saw that um, nothing is right <laughs> or uh, well, anyway, <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I'd like to point it out with your comments. Uh, about the article, we are definitely planning on writing it. <laughs> we just don't have uh, enough time to do it. Yeah, but uh, I agree with you that it's very important to put that in the, the public sp space so that not only people can learn of our experience, but understand how we got there, what motivated us to create this network, and what, uh, what made it possible. Like you said, you know, not only was the, that we have the digital access, the digitizations of our archives, but we had this, um, the possibility to create this collaborative network because other researchers wanted to do this, you know? It was not something that uh, came up of nowhere. It was uh, different people in different institutions doing their researches and thinking in the same way. And we, we ran, it's the culmination of something that people were doing on their own. And it was made possible because we said, oh, why don't we do it together, you know? Why don't we do it together so more people can uh, come see us and to add to their own ideas and their own researches and their own needs, their own motivations. Uh, I think, I, like I said, I would love it that RAN in the future could maybe, I don't know, comprise uh, of more intersectional archives that deal not, yeah, that maybe uh, go to perhaps uh, uh, archives from, uh, that's very important, from different regions of Brazil that have different peoples and different type of documents on them. You know, that go beyond Rio de Janeiro, beyond Sao Paulo, that have uh, a more specific type of documents, uh, maybe with people, like you said, they are not on the borders, they were on the center of so the history, you know? So where are those peoples on the borders? Where are the, their stories, where are the documents? So yeah, I think that's it. And yeah, the internal, internalization is the other one of our main goals that we hope we can achieve. So we can uh, like, uh, have stories from Latin America, for instance, because they're so important. We are so connected in some ways and so strange in others. Yeah, yeah so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And I, I, this, has, this network has uh, many potentials in different lines, uh, not only in terms of uh, archive production, but also in cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness and internationalization and so on. So I think it's amazing. Uh, do you have a question? Any question from the audience? Yeah. Okay, please. Can you help me? <laughs> so, thank you, Nina, for your presentation. I have two uh, easy questions. Uh, first one: uh, Which kind of material can we expect from those collections? Like its biographies, uh, photos, videos, um, files, etc. And the second one: How are you uh, dealing with the files? How are you storage them and and keep them um, for for register? Just that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, mainly textual documents, but a lot of photos. Not that many videos because these archives are more, um, um, uh, not ancient, <laughs> from uh, the early centuries, so not that many videos, you know. Uh, right now, we are, we are the, the archives are more recent, they are coming here to Sepedoki now. We are actually dealing with an, another set of challenge, there are the NATO digital files. <laughs> well, the archives are already born in the digital uh, form but these are very new and not uh, actually available to access by the public. And the other type of question, it's, um, it, varies on, uh, um, it varies on the institution, you know, because uh, actually when we talk about RAM, we're just talking in a way to uh, visualize these archives and the people that get, get to know them more. At CPDOC, at FGV, actually, we use a, um, a digital repository we have the, um, our, our archive, it's actually, 
in the street uh, behind here that we have our bunker where every, everything is stored there, the physical one. And what we do have digitized, we do it in a higher resolution, the TIFF format, in a lower resolution, JPEG, that's what we call, we we'll put it on the website. And we're actually, one of our challenge here, not gonna go into that because I studied that, <laughs> but uh, it's a different question. It's the digital preservation of, uh, of these archives in a long period of time. Because uh, in a way, we already have a lot of experience dealing, uh, preserving the physical, the, the textual, the papers, the maps, uh, the letters, all in that. But everything that has to do with digital is not only very new, but it changes very fast. So one of the things that we are actually dealing and questioning ourselves and, and thinking in new ways, and how can we s talk about long time preservation? Yeah, actually, uh, when you talk about digital preservation or physical preservation, there is no end to it, you know? So a document, it's always being preserved. So we have to make sure that in 100, 200 years from now, you can still access that document. But in the digital, it's hard to, to have this security. Nine possible, maybe. So yeah, um, every institution has its different way of dealing it. And uh, here, we use a, a digital repository by FGV. I don't know if I answer it. Yeah. Thank you. Another question. Um, just, I have first uh, just a short, uh, very specific question about the translation. So, are you planning to translate the data set that you put together about those archives, or part of the content? I'm not sure about uh, what was what was the case. Maybe I missed it. Um, and I, I'm sure we talked about this sometimes before, but I'm gonna just put it here in public as well in case anybody else. Uh, is interested. Uh, I keep th thinking of ways of moving uh, forward in using more digital resources that are available to uh, explore these hidden voices and these archives. Uh, for example, using web semantic technologies to connect, to link this data to data from other archives since you're already a network. So using international standards for metadata or, and other ways of connecting that information that, so that people would find it more easily. They, they wouldn't have to necessarily know the RAM website to get to know the project or, he, or listen to you somewhere in an event because this would be reached from different endpoints. Um, or maybe, use, um, maybe using like our data science students here or at Zepedoc for um, to help think of data visualization, for example, in networks, or these women uh, are represented in the archives here, somehow connected to the women in Sao Paulo, because I know it's the mor more or less the same time period, and if they are more or less all white, upper middle class women, maybe they were together in, in networks, um, and that could be very interesting and lead to new findings about these women's activities. And finally, something that, uh, that I think that I'm very curious about is automatic extraction of named entities. Like from because of all the archives, not only from the women archives, because we have more than 200 personal archives here at Cepedoc. Uh, most of them, as you said, are archives uh, by, no, arch uh, are papers collected and kept under the name of a male person, uh, but I'm sure there are many women cited on these documents. People they write to, they, that they receive letters from, that they mention in their reports or whatever. And maybe being able to identify automatically all women mentioned in these archives, I wonder how many women we will have mentioned there and who are they? Um, so this is something that I think would be really nice. Yeah, I think that's it. Just putting here, <laughs> sharing ways to, to continue it. And congratulations, I think this is a very inspiring project. I love it. Yeah, thank you, Juliana. Uh, like I said, we already talked about this before because it's a, um, a great uh, passion of ours, I think, you know, 
to explore this and think in new ways. I think um, uh, the website maybe or RAM is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, there are many things that we, many ways and many digital tools that can use to uh, to think how we can um, enrich this type of, of uh, resource that we are presenting here. You know, and l like you said, um, to to research these women hidden inside the, the, the male's archives, it's a very interesting way because uh, I think that's when we think about the hidden silence or the absence or in the archives, the absence of this woman, they are there. They are named, you know, they are sometimes, yeah, they are uh, sometimes um, mothers, daughters, wives, or secretaries, or people that were part of uh, the in this case, the Brazilian uh, society, but because they were not recognized maybe in an official manner or, or they don't have their own personal archive, which is another question, yeah, who gets to have their own personal archive? It's not that they are not there. And this could be a very interesting way because, uh, like you said, uh, uh, it's a, a qualitative research, not a quantitative, but it's also kind of, uh, I call it a medium data. <laughs> Because it's not small data, it's also not very big data, <laughs> it's medium data. But uh, it could be a way that we could uh, show them, uh, to make them more visible, really. So uh, I think, uh, it, it's, uh, I'd like, uh, actually like to thank you for the um, organizing this event, you know, because uh, when I was to present, I was kind of confused because, oh, but uh, what does my research has to do with data science, you know? But I think uh, it's nice to present here so we can think of how we can, okay, we just did this, we have RAM, we have this network, how can we go further? What else can we do with, with them? What, can, what can we do with Sepedoc? What can we do with the archives that are in Sao Paulo, Yeah. What are the connections? How can we uh, improve this? And how can we show it to people how to use this in their own researches? So uh, I think uh, we have a, still have a long way to go, but we are going. So that's nice. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Congratulations. OK, so please, Erden, yes, feel free to present. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so today I will talk about a, a computational science, social science project that we worked uh, on uh, for, for a relatively long time, for five years, uh, between 2016 and 2021. Uh, it is called GLOCON, Con Global Contentious Col Politics Dataset, and we used artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence methods uh, to extract, in an automatic way, protest information from uh, online news sources in a number of countries, including uh, Brazil. And I'm really happy uh, to be able to share my, uh, this results of this project with you in Brazil uh, and so this is actually has just been finalized we haven't even uh, officially released the data set but these days so we are wrapping up the final documentation of the project and uh, hopefully you will share an informative email about it uh, in an uh, announcement uh, format uh, So the larger project uh, is called Emerging Welfare. So this is an ERC starting grant project, uh, which aims to explain welfare state development in, in a number of uh, emerging market economies, including Brazil, Turkey, South Africa, India, Argentina, and, uh, and China. 
and we, we uh, in, in these countries, as you have also experienced here since the 2000s, there is a welfare state expansion, very, uh, very important and unprecedented welfare state expansion. Uh, welfare provision and especially in, in social assistance programs have very ex, uh, expanded uh, significantly and large and mostly uh, informal urban and rural populations who had been excluded from the welfare state during the developmentalist period are now covered uh, by the welfare state and Bosa Familia for example is a very important example of this trend and my research try to explain the politics behind this welfare state expansion. Uh, and so I, I asked two uh, basic questions. Is there a new global welfare state regime structure? This is, very, uh, this is not very much related to computational social science, but uh, if you are familiar with social policy, uh, social welfare literature, there is this famous guy, Augusta Esping Anderson, and he is uh, 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 three words of welfare, and I try to incorporate a, a global understanding, global analysis to this literature, and we show that in a separate analysis and paper, it's a separate part of the project, that uh, these countries, including Brazil and Turkey, they formed a new welfare state regime, and we call this the populist welfare state uh, regime, uh, on the basis of very generous uh, social uh, assistance and uh, social programs for the poor. And uh, so the, 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 the uh, second question, oh. ah. I mean, the second question is, uh, so if there is a new welfare state regime, what is the cause for the emergence of this welfare state regime. And I countered against the uh, domination of structuralist, uh, demographic, economist uh, explanations behind this welfare state development and tried to explore contentious politics behind this uh, new social formation. And I particularly look at uh, the political effects of uh, the poor people's movements in these countries. Uh, so, I mean, in, in short, my hypothesis was that, uh, so governments expand, and so there is a global pattern in very distant countries, including India, China, South Africa, Turkey. These are very different countries, politically, historically, culturally, but there is a pattern in which governments are increasingly delivering such programs to the poor. And I argue that the main factor was that the poor in these countries have become the main actor of social movements in these countries. Uh, for example, you can think about the MST movement in Brazil. Or, I mean, I also consider, I mean, my definition of contentious politics is large. That includes the... Uh, social unrest in Brazilian favelas, for example. So this is a threat to uh, public security. This is a threat to state sovereignty in general. And uh, successive Brazilian governments have tried to contain this threat, possibly with the use of Bolsa Familia as well. And in Turkey, there are similar patterns. Uh, slum areas are very dangerous for the state. And the Kurdish question, uh, I mean, uh, maybe I, I'm sure you are familiar with. And the Kurds are a really poor population, and the Turkish government is trying to buy these people off by delivering more and more social assistance to uh, the Kurdish poor. So, uh, therefore, I, I believe that contentious politics is an important key factor behind this welfare expansion. And in order to uh, confirm such an hypothesis, I needed data on uh, social movements, and which did not exist, because especially such a, in such a comparative uh, analysis, the only available uh, data was like strike statistics, government official strike statistics, but I'm looking at a, a much more a broader definition of social movements, therefore we needed to create this. And 
Our definition of contentious politics includes street demonstrations, industrial actions, group clashes, actions targeting officials or civilians like uh, guerrilla movements, assassinations, any threat coming from the society against power holders. Okay. And uh, so, uh, news archives and newspapers have been historically the main source of social movement scholars who are interested in protest event analysis because news I mean newspapers they record events and especially protest events and this literature this scholarship had been mostly manual uh, based on manual coding this is what I did for example in my PhD dissertation at Johns Hopkins and there was no I was not digitalized at least, so I, I, I coded everything uh, manually and it, it took me like one and a half years and I promised myself that no one should do this again. Uh, and then uh, when I started at Coach, I mean this everything, uh, this automated methods of protest event collection uh, were already accelerating. and. Uh, there are like some pros and cons of each method and the manual method of course is more high quality so humans are coding everything but they are not replicable and if you change your mind in terms of protest event definition it is now too late and it is costly uh, timely I mean, time consuming etc etc and automatic methods uh, they are more transparent if your uh, if your codes and data is also uh, publicly available. Obviously, they are fast, replicable. But uh, again, it, I mean, you need a huge effort in uh, if you are using supervised machine learning, uh, as I will uh, briefly uh, describe. You need to spend a lot of time in uh, training data uh, creation, and there are some already existing uh, projects for uh, like uh, protests or conflict event uh, detection and they are but mostly and I mean almost uh, like 90 percent of these projects are by the way funded by uh, American uh, like by Pentagon a uh, Ministry of Defense so uh, because they are trying to predict conflict and then prevent conflict and uh, so this is a very security oriented literature uh, and we we, we, uh, I mean, we relied on public funds to open up space for a more social movement oriented uh, perspective into this uh, <coughs> uh, scholarship. Uh, reliability and validity, these are important concerns uh, because if you are especially look, uh, uh, creating data from a large number of countries, uh, protest types, uh, participant types, they are all uh, very heterogeneous and uh, how, how are you going to create a comparative data set and uh, using for example keywords uh, makes everything easier computationally but it's uh, uh, much harder to get a generalizable results uh, and, uh, and machine learning models uh, trained for one country is hard to uh, apply uh, in another country etc. And for validity uh, so there is there was no gold standard corpus uh, before this project I mean there was no corpus I mean these previous projects they created their own data set but they never uh, share it with the public uh, we and so there was no gold standard corpus meaning uh, we annotated NIFS articles uh, with two annotators and they are uh, cross-checked and they are then educated corrected uh, and uh, we believe that even if in the end the project uh, data set would fail to uh, describe, at least the gold standard corpus was uh, something uh, that would be valuable for the academic community. But in the end, it turned out uh, well uh, in terms of the final outcome. Oh. So how do we do this? Uh, we use uh, NLP and machine learning methods. 
and our algorithm has two parts our like tools classification and extraction first of all for example we take uh, India and then uh, we started with India and then we downloaded uh, the uh, news articles from the main uh, Indian news uh, papers uh, and uh, and they are uh, all English by the way so the, the Indian Times the new, the Hindu uh, Indian Express and they are really really high quality papers and then uh, we download 12 million news articles from India then we randomly choose 12,000 of them and then our uh, graduate students at Koch University they annotated uh, these documents in terms of uh, whether or not they contain a protest event or not uh, and uh, we train these uh, annotators uh, very, for a very long time in terms of the content and type of social movements and politics in India. So that was a really uh, time-consuming effort. And we created uh, annotators uh, to be able to, uh, I mean, specific for India. And then we built our models and they are working very well. So, I mean, we, uh, over 95% confidence we are able to predict now even if a news article is uh, containing a protest event uh, in India and also in other countries. Then uh, information extraction part uh, needed another annotation protest, uh, annotation task. This time we, we annotate at the sentence level and uh, which sentence in the document is about the protest and then which words are about which characteristics of the protest in each sentence, like protester, participant, ideology, location, etc. And this is the detailed annotation uh, task. Um, I put too many annotation uh, animations, I think, and this is not working. Can you see in your Can you screen? Can you move? Ah, okay. 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 Uh, and uh, uh, so we, we, our countries included China, India, South Africa, uh, Brazil, uh, like Argentina, and then we, we, we uh, not yet Mexico and Colombia, but as I said, uh, more than 10 million. So I already talked about this uh, information. And we created a uh, gold standard corpus, double annotation, annotation, education, and we use state of the art machine learning models, BERT, and active learning. And for generalizability uh, of our results, uh, we, we develop a novel uh, approach to a gold standard corpus uh, selection. Uh, other projects, automated projects, so you need. Uh, to have a corpus to be annotated right? and how do you select this sample of corpus I mean other projects use keywords but uh, we choose another more difficult path of choosing randomly uh, from this uh, entire archive this allows I mean this makes it much more difficult to find positive cases and it requires a higher number of annotations but at the same time, it, is, it enables you to have more generaliz generalizable results over time and across countries. Because there are new, if you, you can use a keyword, but next year uh, a new type of protest event can emerge. Or in another country, uh, so you encounter with another uh, protest type, which is not included in your keyword list. Uh, so we use therefore random sampling. Uh, so news uh, documents, then we uh, identify uh, protest related events, then we identify the event sentence, and then we identify event participants, place, time, and semantic categories like uh, types of protest events or types of participants, types of organizers. Uh, so it's. Uh, uh, the website is called, so I uh, didn't put it here, but glocon.ku.edu. So I will 
show you, but I, yeah, I mean, glocon.ku.edu.tr. So, ha, I put it. So, this is, I put some examples. I was hoping to use my laptop to uh, simulate, uh, to do some demos, but uh, please go and check the website. And I put some uh, examples from Brazil. Uh, in so we really work on this visualization of the data set. Uh, so you, you can choose the event types. And for example, in this case, I choose demonstrations and peasants. So this shows the distribution timely and geographical distribution of protest uh, peasant demonstrations in Brazil. Uh, and this shows demonstrations, but we color by color it by a participant type. Uh, for example, this shows that so the protests in like the Sao Paulo and the Rio area are more led by activists, by in other areas in the north. I mean, so it's complicated. Uh, so I put some uh, graphs also for, uh, I mean, some validity. Uh, so this is, a, what, we took this data uh, for another article from, uh, from CPT, Commission Pastoral of, uh, uh, of Land uh, of, of, of CPT. So this is uh, a church organization. They collected data uh, of uh, MST movements land uh, occupations. Uh, it's a really, really high quality data set. And uh, I, when we compare this, our data set and their, I and mean, this is a benchmark data, this is real data. And the patterns, at least, I mean, the geographical patterns uh, are in parallel. And also, when we look at the temporal trends, so this is what we find. And this is, uh, I mean, this is uh, from CPT, the number of families participating in land invasions and the number of land invasions by year. And this shows the uh, contentious political events by the peasantry in Brazil uh, in the same time period, 2000 and 2013. Uh, so the, the pattern uh, is very similar. So. It seems that so we are working on a new paper to show, uh, to to illustrate different ways to valid validate our data set. But these initial findings uh, are quite uh, positive. Uh, how much time we do are, I? We are running time. In fact, we are on. Okay, so uh, I can uh, talk about uh, more technical details uh, of the uh, of the project. Uh, maybe as uh, as a response to your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Herden. Uh, I think it was very very interesting platform. Uh, I, I've been researching social movements for more than ten years, so I'm very curious about this. Uh, I'll use it further on my research for oh, sure. Okay. Uh, and when you presented the peasants' movements, I didn't see land, landless. Can I? Yes. I, I forgot to say something very important. I would like to uh, thank um, uh, uh, for this project. Uh, we also uh, collaborated with USP, and uh, there were eight graduate students from sociology program of USP who did the uh, annotation of Brazilian and uh, Spanish, uh, Portuguese and Spanish news articles from uh, Brazil and Argentina. Uh, and yeah, so I would like <laughs> to thank them also here. That's nice, that's nice. Uh, and then w when you talk about the peasants' movements, I guess the landless movements in Brazil, uh, the, the the, the time of the, the demonstrations when they, r they were very, very high, uh, it, it remain, reminds me not only the land grabbing question in Brazil, but also the, it was the same period 
of uh, the release of the first transgenic seed, GM seed in Brazil as well. And it uh, rose many controversies around this, if it's, uh, it was artificial or not, uh -huh. and so on. So it's uh, very interesting because somehow we connect with history as well, so digitalization, history, and so on. And I think it's important to reflect or uh, to reflect on the role of the protest in society and the political protests. So it's important to understand the way they organize. Uh, so this is a very, very interesting methodology that you use. So considering time constraint, <laughs> I'm going to move for my, my questions. Now, the first one is, I know that you collect data randomly and somehow it is very close to pastoral da terra in terms of results. But depending on the new sources that you collected from Brazil, from my research in agri-food movements, uh, you won't see much. And maybe some, depending on the source, for instance, if you uh, go uh, uh, through Estadão, which is a large newspaper from Sao Paulo, you would find much of a criminalization of the movements, mm -hmm. or the way they present this protest is in a very bad way. So, uh, and then you mentioned validity, and of course this is very important in research. So my question to you, I understand that you collect data randomly, but how do you balance these challenges? I'm not in machine learning, so I'm not, I don't know how do you do that. But one of my concerns is that because recently I've made this research with 3,000 newspapers from Folha de São Paulo, which is the, the largest uh, newspaper in Brazil, with an Estadão, and data were a bit different because at least Folha mentioned the, the social movement. I was talking about agroecology at that time. But Isadon even, you know, Isadon didn't care of the agenda, didn't mention the agenda. And when mentioned, it was criminalizing the agenda of the protest. So my question to you is, how do you do this with machine learning? How can you balance this source of media, the media source that you have? Can I respond? Sure. This is a very important question. Um, so actually, the use of AI is one, uh, I mean, your question is one of the reasons that motivated us to use AI. Because uh, newspaper is bias is one of the types of errors in this protest event literature. And there are like tons of biases, like editorial biases, ideological biases. Uh, there are different capacities, etc. Uh, therefore, uh, in, in manual methods, it is hard to uh, code or process uh, large numbers of different newspapers. It, it takes a lot of time. But when you use AI, you can include different newspapers uh, without taking much time. That's why here we are using both uh, Folia and Estadao. Uh, and uh, for India, we are using three different uh, newspapers. And uh, so when you, when you actually bring together uh, different newspapers with different biases, the expectation is that at least they will, um, the, 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 the final data will, will cancel out some of the errors and you will get a much more uh, reliable uh, data set. This is the, the best you can do. But in our uh, website, we will allow the users uh, to choose which newspapers uh, as the main source. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you have this now? No. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. And, uh, and so we will, uh, pub we will share the, the raw data set as well. And in this data set, is so I mean a user can uh, choose uh, uh, so different news sources or they can combine it uh, as, as they wish but the randomness is not that so we are uh, taking uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are we are randomly taking the final outcome but we are randomly choosing the annotated uh, gold uh, corpus from the NIFS archive. So randomness comes at that point. 
by build by building the gold standard corpus training data. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I think that maybe one way to avoid or, or to analyze the ideology and bias and so on could be the combination of yeah. data. Yes, it, this is a one side of the research, and then you can combine this yeah. data with the other. Um, and the other question is, if you have any results so far used in, in the paper that you would like to comment, I know that you've mentioned the welfare uh, regime research that you're now Ye conducting, but yeah. if you have any other data that could bring source for different countries, and so do you have any results from these tools? Yeah, so I mean, we, we, we analyze uh, a lot, so I mean, in in f so uh, when we analyze globally uh, we we show that uh, social assistance provision globally is a function of uh, the the extent of violent social unrest in each country so governments are expanding social assistance when they are threatened by violent social unrest not uh, by the rate of poverty but by the rate of social unrest and we look at India and we show that government is using the NREGA social work, uh, workfare program against the Naxalite, against the Maoist unrest. Here they are against, used against the MSD movement. In Turkey against the Kurdish movement. In South Africa against the black uh, neighborhood, like poor uh, protest movements. Uh, in China again against uh, rural uh, unrest. Uh, and it's very interesting, in all these countries, governments have the same logic of securitizing social assistance uh, as, a, as a, a way to establish public order. And in addition to their use, uh, their populist use of social assistance programs to win the elections, obviously. I mean, this is what uh, mm -hmm. Bolsonaro tried to did yes, in the very yes. last minute, but uh, hopefully, uh, but he failed. And, and it, it shows as well uh, why some societies engage more in political protest than others. So th I think this is interesting as well to see protesting in demonstration, for instance, in, in, the fr in France is very different from protesting in yeah. Brazil. And the way they, this is showed up uh, externally as well. Yeah. So very nice. So do you have any questions uh, from the audience? Please. I'm sorry, I know we have little time, so I'll be quick. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for this beautiful project. It's very inspiring, and I'm looking forward to looking at it. I love how you bring this macro historical sociology agenda and authors together with computational social sciences, like you mentioned, Espin Anderson. And to me, Glocon is like an improvement of. Back in the days, Charles Tilly's work on contentious politics, yeah. but now looking for emerging economies. Um, exactly. Very, very interesting. Uh, I really liked how you explained why you chose to use a random uh, sample because of this. I was uh, about to ask that, but you answered in your presentation. It's, it has to do with the generalization throughout time because that's very, I think, intelligent because this terminology and how we call things are changing all the time, especially now with social media and, yeah. and how it, um, yeah, we talk about these events in, in communication nowadays. Uh, but I, I'll have many questions, I'll make just one. Uh -huh. um, about this, you, so you automatically classify this type of events, organizations, uh, you extract locations and participants, etc. Um, for for the semantic classification, have you built like specific dictionaries about conflict or mm -hmm. e protest events? Like, are these dictionary? I don't know if it's dictionaries that you use or ontologies, or yeah, if yeah, you could yeah. just uh, talk a little bit more about that. The code book manuals. Code book. Yeah. So there are. So in this website, you can find them. So. Before uh, the annotation process, we create long, long annotation uh, manuals uh, and to define what is meant by a peasant protest, etc. 
so types of protests, what is assassination, what is group clash, what is right wing, what is left wing in India, and which organizations are communist and which are like fascist and etc. So you have to uh, define what you mean by certain concepts. This is really, really uh, crucial because in the end, I understand that uh, these days, especially with Python, even high school kids, they are doing machine learning, uh, really. It's not a big deal. Uh, but the important thing is the social science part of it because uh, engineers, does, they do not know what a left-wing person looks like in Argentina. So. And uh, so, therefore, this conceptualization and it is uh, transferred to the coders. And so, the quality of domain experts, the quality of these uh, annotators uh, is really, really so important. Uh, we, I mean, this, uh, we, I mean, it's USP, uh, it's a really great school, and this, the students are really excellent intellectuals, and they knew what was going on, and they provided a lot of feedback to us uh, and I think the social science part is much more important uh, this is my overall uh, conclusion uh, from five years thank you thank you very much Herdan so let's <laughs> so um, I have just final comments that every presentation here uh, somehow uh, reflect upon digi the digital environment and digitalization and the role of digitalization in social sciences in general. Also, uh, the importance of quantitative and qualitative data in terms of data-driven as well and, and for future research, for future researchers that we have. And what I think is very interesting is that we all reflect about the global south and emerging economies. So thank you very much for your inspiring work, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you very much.